Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Where we spill the jams and spin the tea I wish I could say I did that on purpose But I didn't <laughs> Because today is a very special episode, so I guess I was just feeling really fucking special. But today, we are not going to be covering two new releases and a record club. Because, well, to be frank, we didn't really think that would make for a very interesting episode and decided to go down a different path. <laughs> and today, we are going to be covering my favorite band, Porcupine Tree. We are going to be covering their record, Deadwing back to back with Stephen Wilson, the frontman of Porcupine Tree, his solo effort, 2015 solo effort, is that the right year? Oh. 2015 oh. solo effort, Hand Cannot Erase. We are doing this preemptively so we can talk about one of our favorite artists before he releases his new album, The Future Bites, which we will be covering on a subsequent episode of this show. And... And, not stopping there, for today's Record Club episode, we're not really doing a Record Club, but instead a sort of uh, in-memoriam uh, sort of thing, because we recently lost a legend in the world of hip-hop, one Mr. Daniel Dumoulay, MF Doom, also known by the name Victor Vaughn, of which we are going to be covering the first Victor Vaughn project, Vaudeville Villain, uh, to commemorate him. And yeah, that is what we are going to be doing on this week's episode, and we have all been so fucking excited just because yeah. these have been this. I, I'm I've I've been so excited for this all week. <laughs> and, and just to clarify for if we have any viewers watching who haven't seen the show before, we normally use this space to review new releases, but obviously January it tends to be a slow month for new releases, so we thought we'd Ain't do something special. Out. Yeah, exactly. We will be uh, going back to reviewing new releases next week, but um, this is something special that I think we have kind of, with all the hard work we put into this podcast, I think we kind of earned the right to uh, listen to and talk about a couple of records, which I'm going to be bold and say I'm pretty sure that all of us enjoy uh, to, to, to some degree. Uh, and, and, and Stephen Wilson's an incredibly special artist to um, the majority of us. Um, and I think you'll hear some interesting stories, and it'll be a really fun time. So, yeah. And I would also just like to put out there that it's like if we ever have a uh, week on the podcast where everything is looking pretty light and there aren't any demanding releases, that perhaps we could do something like this again in the future if it is well-received, if people like it, if we enjoy doing it. It is probably a good substitute for just instead of, like, covering shit that we just don't mm. care about. Yeah, and if you are new to the podcast as well, we don't just discuss new releases generally as well. No. We do, as, as uh, Jake's referred to, we do a record club every week where we discuss a sort of classic record or a record that from that maybe doesn't get the sort of attention and discussion that it deserves online and we also do full discography reviews as well our full discography review of laura marling recently went online her seven fantastic records and we're going to be discussing the discography of uh the seminal indie rock band block party quite soon as well so we cover a variety of artists and uh, we have a lot really interesting uh discussions album discussions artist discussions lined up in the very near future and that perfectly segues into our what we have been listening to this week segment because normally we do that in our acronym order and i have been listening to well, frankly, two, my, my week has been dominated by two artists that I cannot talk about because A, one of them is Steven Wilson. I have gone through all of my upper tier favorite Porcupine Tree projects and all of his solo work so I could brush up on everything he's done. Um, I did also listen to uh, Blackfield 2, which is one of his side bands that he has. Um, as well as uh, Bass Communion 3, which is his ambient side project, uh, the third um album sort of in that like mainline series that i listened to um 
but I'll just kind of shove that aside, uh, and I'll wait for that to become a little bit more pertinent. But the other band that I've been listening to very, 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 very extensively is, of course, Block Party. Uh, I listened to, of course, Silent Alarm. I listened to A Weekend in the City. I listened to uh, Intimacy. I listened to Four. And I did not get to hymns just because it was like, that. I, I just didn't really feel like it. I'm going to do that tomorrow. Um, but, uh, I will save my thoughts for the episode that we are going to be doing then. Uh, needless to say, though, Block Party. Good band. I like them. Good. Um, uh, some sort of odds and ends that I've listened to this week, um, just at random, uh, I gave a re-listen to one of my favorite albums from its perspective year that I just have not visited in a while, and that is uh, Little Dark Age by MGMT, uh, which was a fucking, it was a great release that just sort of, like, dominated the first, like, third of that year for me, just because, like, no really, no albums grabbed me that I listened to. I was just sort of listening to that on repeat, and so I, I think I burnt myself out on it, and then just didn't listen to it for a long time, and I went back to it, and God, it's just one of the most remarkably consistent electropop albums of the decade. Holy shit, is that album a whole lot of fun. Um, it's produced sublimely, it's got hooky songwriting, it just, it's, it's, it's just pleasurable to listen to, uh, and it's, it's very, it's very sweet and, and earnest, and, and I, I, I love it. It's a very, very good record. Um... I also listened uh, a lot to, um, in, in, again, this is just fucking surprise, Jake Lewis is the boy genius people a lot. <laughs> I, I've, I've really been spinning uh, Julian Baker's two records these last two weeks, like a lot, like a lot, a lot. I got um, Turn on the Bright Lights uh, on vinyl. It sounds real, real good. As I said it again, I know, Tyler, you don't have to laugh at me. I'm sorry. I did it again. I'm hey, bad. I was, I was going to say something and decided not to. <laughs> I just decided to laugh instead. Um, so. No, it's, it was quite funny. La last up on uh, the last thing I'll talk about so, is, oh, I re-listened to um, pod, uh, podcast favorite. Uh, I listened to Painting of a Panic Attack by Frightened Rabbit again. I'm just sort of going through some of my old favorite records to listen to for the first time this year, and I finally moved that up on my favorites list. Uh, it is only behind Phoebe Bridger's Punisher now. Uh, that is my second favorite record. It even beat out Devin Townsend's Ocean Machine. I, I, I just couldn't hold back any longer. I, I love it too much. Uh, yeah, that's what I've been listening to this week. Okay, so yeah, that'll uh, transition sharply to me. I'll uh, first touch on something I kind of listened to last week but wanted to address this week. Uh, Steely Dan's Can't Buy a Thrill, a very fun, kind of comically dark album from... That, that, that's uh, one, Steely Dan, all right. One of Tyler's uh, rising favorite bands, uh, Steely Dan. Uh, it's... It's a lot of, uh, from what I've heard from you, Tyler, uh, this is like their most kind of straightforward record. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a difficult word to to know if that's right to use. Like, it's the most kind of consistently radio friendly, I guess I'll say. Okay, yeah. But there are other yes, records of most straightforward Mars Volta record. But there are other <laughs> records. There are other records of theirs that are less radio friendly, but more direct. So it's kind of hard to know what to... Okay, yeah, well... Yeah, but anyway... Uh, no, but that's, yeah, radio-friendly kind of what I'm getting at. But, you know, it's a fun, fun album. I uh, I would like to try out some of their other stuff, but, you know, it's, it's not too bad. Yeah, uh, uh, what, what I always say... Uh, I always say... I've been saying it for like a week of my life. <laughs> um, is if you're a Steely Dan skeptic, the one to listen to is Countdown to Ecstasy, their second album that's the one to start with um for anyone Steely really dan man has logged on okay so uh idm release various artists compilation the uh artificial intelligence comp from warp records released in the 90s i listened to this because this is how has some early uh autecker and um richard d james songs it's not 
amazing. A lot of it sounds incredibly dated and cheesy, but it's it's worth it for the the history behind it. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those um, things where it's like you can it's a patchwork sort of compilation of where the scene was at, and you can listen to it and you can tell who the rising voices are going to be versus who's going to get forgotten uh, as the time as time goes on. Yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, so otherwise, uh, everyone who's not Autic or an Apex twin. <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> Hang I on. mean, there's. I think there's an orb track on there, and he was yeah. kind of big for some time. The orb are a great, uh, are, yeah. are a great act with uh, multiple very important records. I'm trying to remember what's actually on this compilation. The, there's also like a, a Speedy J song, and if you can tell me one record Speedy J made, I will pay you a thousand dollars. What else is on here? Can I still get the thousand dollars if I Google it first? No. <laughs> nice yeah. try. The Speedy, Speedy J sounds like a guy who had an album and who would, that would be named like "Confrontations of the Inner Mechanisms, <laughs> Volume 13 or some shit. I recommend August. I recommend checking out the Artificial Intelligence Two compilation. Yeah. Because um, I think that one is narrowly better. Um, no, but, I have to. But they're basically kind of the same, both just kind of like sort of six, seven out of ten compilations that have yeah. quite obvious highlights. No. Uh, but um, I believe the Orteca track on the first one is, or one of the Orteca tracks on the first one, is just a song that they would reuse for Incanabula anyway. So, yeah. Um, just listen to Incanabula. It's a better record. Narrowly, but yes. Uh, then uh, next thing, uh, Blue Lines by Massive Attack, the album that basically created trip hop. It's uh, it's got, I mean, it's baller. It's got great, Banger. great verses from like Tricky, who was a very early member of Massive Attack. You've got some great stuff from 3D. Uh, I forget the lady's name who was only on that one album, but she has some great tracks on there. Uh, and you know it's it's just a really good mission statement for what the genre would be and is and you know it's also like nine songs long so you got no reason not to listen to it if you haven't next thing an album by the pet shop boys actually they're kind of uh it, it's a very fun synth poppy album that i think if for all things considered, it has aged incredibly well. It is a very, it, it's full of just amazing tracks, like the first song on there. It's great. Uh, it's got It's a Sin, which is as the it, most gigantic. I, I found out about actually because It's a Sin, I believe, is on the soundtrack to the movie Bronson. And I just listened to that song. And I'm like, Jesus, this fucking goes. It's got the like hugest fucking hook of all time. It's so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's rad. And there's also a song on there that is written by Ennio Morricone. So that's <laughs> holy shit. Yeah, and it's that's not awesome. not a bad ballad. It's pretty good. Uh final thing. Uh from the what? mothers. Hmm? Ennio, Ennio Morricone and the pet shop boys. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you is that is that what you just said to me? That is precisely what I just told you. <laughs> Fucking John Turturro and O oh Brother over here. <laughs> Do not that seek the treasure. Sorry. That don't make no sense. <laughs> it doesn't, and it's amazing. That's <laughs> all I can say. Carry on. Uh, final thing. From the Mothers of Invention, their debut album, uh, Freak Out. This is like uh, obviously Frank Zappa's band. It's the like the first double album ever released. Uh, I really like the super weird moments on it, like shit like uh, "Who Are the Brain Police" and the last song, or as I uh, I call it in my head, the worst trip to the dentist's office ever. Uh, but. As a whole, I think there's a lot of tracks where he, you're seeing the personality and persona of Frank Zappa develop, but it's not it's not quite there to the extent it would be on later LPs like uh, Apostrophe, most notably. But it's still a 
I mean, it's a classic album. I'm going to say it's still good. No shit, it's still good. That's, that's <laughs> my week. Okay. So what I listened to, uh, uh, most notably for the thing that I listened to for the first time, was uh, the first Slow Dive album, just for a day. Uh, I went and oh. downloaded all of the, the flax for their albums. Mm. And it's, it's, it's very good. It's yeah. um, I, it, it, it has the, the handicap of me having heard Suvlaki first. Um, That's, yeah, it's just kind which of the is, weakest one. I mean, yeah. it's just more or less Suvlaki, but less developed and strong yeah. in every aspect. But you know that's still it's just like seven and a half, eight out of yeah. ten, still yeah. pretty baller. It's like, it's like the slow dive is like pizza. It doesn't just you can't it's not it, you can't it can't be bad. Um, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, uh, yeah. In the spirit of Porcupine Tree, Stephen Wilson, things I gave a re-listen to uh, their nineteen ninety. A eight album stupid dream which ah. of the like the great uh porcupine tree albums that was comfortably my least favorite and it remains comfortably my least favorite um i even i, I would say i prefer even like signify and sky move sideways over it good it's also take. like it's it it's just i i, I find it as like them at their like most developed at that point in their career, but also at their most safe, I guess. I, I think it's, it's actually a really good way to describe it, yeah. And like it's also still feels very transitional between like the uh I, I he he Wilson has a name for those like first four albums. It's like just, the the moonlight daydream years or some shit like that i don't know the delirium um, years yes that thank you um don't ask me how i know that i don't even know it was it was somewhere <sighs> in my brain i mean anyway um it's it still feels very much like a transitional album between that era and the in absentia era and as such it's i kind of feel like it's weaker than either it's um, very art rocky too, and it's like I if I had to pick a flavor of porcupine tree that is my least favorite, it's probably their art rocky shit. Um, but I agree with I, I I like love that album, but like it is also comfortably my least favorite of the great porcupine tree albums. Like I listen to Sky Move Sideways today, and I, there there's not a universe that I prefer Stupid Dream over that album. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, what else did I listen to? I, I listened to, uh, inspired by conversation we had on this segment last week, I gave a re-listen to Exit Stage Left, the live Rush album. Oh, yes. Which, like, especially on songs like Closer to the Heart, where you can, like, hear the crowd participating, it's like, it really just adds another dimension to those songs, being able to hear them recorded live and, like, there is I mean, it's just like the best live act ever in their prime so you know and it's like a pitch pitch perfect capturing of that so like it's fucking yeah. if anything neil is better live like can be shit. yeah <laughs> um yeah that's that's the only thing of interest i have so i had an interesting journey to this record um i was listening to an audio book of a John Ronson book. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's a British journalist. He's written some books. Um, the Man Who Stare at Goats was based on one of his novels, but this oh. was uh, not one of his novels, one of his journalistic books. Um, and this was a collection of uh, articles he'd written in The Guardian. And the last one was the story of uh, behind the movie Frank, which John wrote because... Um, John right. was the keyboardist for Frank Stidebottom before he was a journalist. Um, with mad trajectory. But, um, and one of the things he mentioned was how they de-fictionalized the story of Frank Stidebottom to make Frank Bank incorporating lots of other maligned acts in history here on the fringes, uh, many of whom we talked about when we talked about Farrah Abraham. Specifically, the Shags philosophy of uh, the whole universe, I want to say. 
the whole world? Something like that. Uh, yeah, so, philosophy yeah. of the world. Thank you. And one, and they talked about the fact that uh, Kurt Cobain listed that record as his fifth favorite album of all time, um, which led me to sort to wild. seek out. I know, right? But led me out of morbid curiosity to seek out his full list of fifty. <laughs> then led me to be listening to "Dry" by P.J. Harvey. Oh, um, ah, significantly less good than the Shags. For <laughs> <laughs> At least according to Kurt Cobain. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can totally see the influence, um, and I really, 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 really liked it a lot. Uh, "Dry" is um, a fucking fantastic record, and basically it's like it's it's a fantastic record in its own right but it's also like the just for a day to rid of me souvlaki like it's yes, like exactly. rid of me is basically everything that makes dry great but even more kind of unfriendly and gnarly and twisted mm. um but both are great albums yes, yes. I especially i'm loved, really glad to sorry i especially love the song dress which is one of my favorite pj harvey songs. oh dress is yes, so good yes so yes good Big cosign there, but no, I liked it a lot. Um, and it was really interesting listening to it in the context of it being on that list, um, because I can totally like see the progression between those two acts, I suppose. Um, what else have I been listening to this week? Uh, so based upon Tyler's talking about it, I listened to You Fabulum by Square Pusher. Oh yeah. Um, which I, I had a really great time with. Um, it's like it's square pusher so of course he is always doing something new for him in a way that's very self-aware and kind of like cheeky um i think i described this album as like like listening to a george carlin set if it was an idm record um <laughs> what <'Cause>... dope. <laughs> it's just, yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's just really fucking fun and cheeky and mm-hmm. subversive and like it flirts with shit that sounds that kind of should feel corny but just mm-hmm. don't because they're done so tongue-in-cheek and just because the songs bang as hard as they do like yeah but yeah. so it's just like the the right the uh, way that it stops and starts and the way the beats flow together reminds me of um like his speech patterns um and they create humor in the same way to me anyway um i would, I have, really I would have never yeah. thought of that but i will give you credit that it kind of does make sense when i think about it like there is a real sense of of captivating rambling to it but it, it's so tightly wound that it never feels like it's getting away from yeah. you or it's meandering well i i just got thinking about how you be cheeky with a purely instrumental record and that led me to there I suppose. Um, uh, but anyway, I really liked it. Um, and I've now listened to three Square Pusher records. And what I th- find so fascinating about this guy is they all sound like totally different, but by the same person audibly. Yeah. Um, and that's just really cool to me. Um, I also listened to the self titled record by Purple Mountains this week. Ah. Uh, very, very, Rich. very important record to me. <laughs> yes. Well, I remember... Astonishing a, I, good album. Well, it's just, I remembered a long, long time ago, you were talking about this record. Um, and the memory just came to me one day and I was like, well, I might as well listen to it now. Um, it did not sound like what I expected it to sound like. It's um, much more accessible, I suppose, than I expected, much more acoustic. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, Americana, almost. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Have you ever listened to Silver Jews, actually, Sersha? No. no I you haven't. need to do that. Yeah. Maybe classic, that. classic indie rock uh, band. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, you know, I'll be here next week saying I listen to them, probably. So, um, yeah. Um, but no, this record's really great. I didn't even know the sort of tragic aftermath of this record until I was talking to Tiger about this record. Mm. Um, so going back to listen to this record with that in context is going to break me. And I'm not going to do it for a yeah, long time. Yeah, I mean, is. like, like <laughs> most of the songs are about death and dying, and mm. like, and and it came out, and it was the the thing that really made it hit hard because obviously there have been artists who have died or even specifically committed suicide, and their last record kind of sort of becomes tied to that. But it was especially 
kind of poignant with this because it was like the first record David had made in like a decade and he died mm. and he died like very shortly after he put it out and, and so yeah it, 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 in many ways it feels like a suicide note but I also know that having listened to it before he died it didn't feel that way but then retrospectively you look at it and like all the signs are there and it's like the relationship I've had with, with that record is, is super fucking difficult uh, maybe one day I'll be able to talk about it at length but the song yeah. specifically I loved being my mother's son is listen to that song just do it mm. if you haven't like geez. oh yes yeah yeah it, it reminds me of like going back to something like uh, the Winter of Mixed Strengths or um, Peyton for Panic Attack after that event. Yeah. Um, of which we talked about in the Frightened Rabbit speech side. If you want to know more. So, um, yeah, it reminds me a lot of that, I think. Of, uh, seeing where this journey ends, I suppose, through contextualizing the journey in itself. Uh, and I'm going to round this off with the fact that this morning I listened to Ballads by John Coltrane, um, which I thought was beautiful um a lot of the time what i get from john coltrane is a lot of energy and a lot of shit happening um but this is just a collection of tracks that are really soft and lovely and well performed yeah he had a period that gets doesn't often get acknowledged during around like 63 62 63 mm -hmm. where he kind of stepped back from the cutting edge and sort of more into kind of bluesier slower jazz he had a couple of collaborative records with duke ellington i believe um, and people always kind of forget about this period of Coltrane because it's not, it's not necessarily what they associate with him, but it's also kind of like an essential part in his narrative to get to the place where, that he's at on something like Love Supreme. Yes, um, absolutely right. I would agree with that completely. Yeah. Um, uh, people who feature on this record in John Coltrane Quartet is uh, McCoy Tyner. Jimmy Garrison ah. and Melvin Jones. So if that doesn't sell this record to you, I don't know what will. That, that's, um, that's, that's Tyner, man. That's the those that's the Coltrane quartet right there. Yes. Oh shit. All right. Well, I suppose that is me. First up, uh, I listened to uh, Miles Davis's final studio record before his sort of retirement in the seventies, before he came back in the eighties and did his kind of weird thing that he did then basically intended to be his final jazz fusion statement a record called get up with it uh mm -hmm. which is a two hour long two hours long basically uh in terms of structure and formatting it's basically him trying to do another bitches brew and what would you know it is just as good as that album mm -hmm. uh it is an absolutely astounding record. It opens with a 30 minute proto ambient piece that, uh, is in, that was a tribute to Duke Ellington who had passed away during the recording sessions uh, and basically birthed Brian Eno's entire ambient career. And he said as much um, would not exist in the form that it did with those classic 70s records if not for this piece called He Loved Him Madly. Uh, and that's just the first fucking 30 minutes of this thing. It goes basically every aspect. It plays kind of like a compilation record in certain senses because it does a lot of, uh, it is compiled from sessions that are over a period of years as most of Miles or as a number of Miles records during this time were, but it was very clearly crafted by Miles to be a definitive and cohesive whole statement. Um, and you get some incredible blistering pieces, but also just really serene and strange. There's a piece on here called uh, Rated X. Um, actually, it's worth mentioning as well that Miles actually spends more time playing the organ on this record than he does playing his trumpet. He became really, really obsessed with the organ and playing it. Uh, and there's this piece called Rated X on this record where he takes, he plays the organ, but he kind of turns it into a noise instrument basically he plays it at ear splitting level and it's mixed really strangely and it's basically like proto noise music it's fucking baller um there's and there's also straight blues on this record there's there's like uh all these kind of different variations on fusion with all these different players compiled from all these different times in the early 70s 
uh, and it's an absolutely essential statement. I wouldn't say listen to it before you listen to records like Bitches Brew or Jack Johnson, mm -hmm. but it certainly is something that uh, needs to be heard and should be built up to. Um, I also want to shout out, I listened to the Frank Turner album, England Keep My Bones, um, which honestly was long overdue considering that I listened to um, Love Iron, Iron Song, Song like half a year ago and, mm -hmm. and I, it was my first Frank Turner record and I, and I, for the record, adore that album. I think it's basically perfect. There's not a single yes. song on it I don't love and there's some songs on it that are just some of my favorite songs ever. And England Keep My Bones did not disappoint. It doesn't reach the stratospheric heights as con of that record as consistently as it does, but it still has a number of, um, obviously I can't say a number of Frank's best songs necessarily because I haven't heard uh, his, all his records, but a number of songs no, that I no, would be- No, it does, it does. A it number has, of songs it does. that I would be stunned if they are not still right at the top of my list once mm -hmm. I have heard all his records. Specifically, uh, I Am Disappeared, which is just my favorite Frank Turner oh. song so far, oh. and Redemption, which That's is amazing. Um, and I also really, really dig Rivers and Peggy Sang the Blues as well. Just some, a oh, bunch of- Peggy really, Sang the Blues. Yeah, just a bunch of really, really good songs in this record. Um, there are some moments I don't particularly care for, like English Curse mm. and We Six Boy, but they're not bad additions to the album they just kind of take me out of the experience a little bit but sure. still it's um it's a really really solid record that i wanted to shout out uh what else i listened to uh, continuing with the search core i listened to get lonely by the mountain goats uh the next sort of records chronologically in my mountain goats journey it comes hot on the heels of the sunset tree and it's notably whereas that record kind of is this kind of vibrant and blistering record that it, it sees John kind of opening up childhood wounds and, 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 and really kind of getting quite in your face on that record. Get Lonely is a much more introspective and withdrawn and, and somehow even more devastating album. Uh, I fucking loved it. It's a very subtle record, mostly acoustic driven, but John's skill for finding really good melodies and also for manipulating tone and timbre uh, within the kind of limited instrumental palette he uses on this record is really just masterful. There's beautiful additions of woodwinds and strings and, and it's just this very kind of quiet, subdued, but absolutely heartbreaking breakup album. Um, and uh, I cannot recommend it enough. Certainly not uh, the record I'd re certainly not a record I'd recommend listening to if you haven't heard many Mountain Goats records. Um, but I feel like it came along at the perfect point for me, having been being really familiar with more aggressive and and intense records like uh, All How West Texas and The Sunset Tree, and, and coming to this was was really really nice. Next record I want to shout out uh, is a record I uh, continuing my journey in the Rush catalog. I listened to Counterparts, uh, which I have to say uh, I think is the best record in there at this point since Power Windows. Uh, I like it more than Hold Your Fire, Presto, and Roll the Bones. Uh, it's it's certainly not at the in, you know approaching the upper echelons of their sound. Um, but I think the, the things that hold it back are much more superficial than the things that hold those other records back, mainly that it's just a little bit too long. Um, but I think the change in sound here into something a bit more aggressive and sort of influenced by, certainly influenced by the grunge scene, this is very much, in a sense, uh, them trying to make a Pearl Jam record, uh, which I fucking love. Uh, I think that the first as ever, um, the, with basically every Rush album, opens really strongly. I think Anime is the best song on here and just incredibly heavy and hard hitting. I, I love the, the, the real, there's a real weight to the riffs and stick it out as well that we haven't heard from Alex in a while at this point in their career. Uh, and Nobody's Hero is just this great, devastating song. Some of Peart's best writing, um, really, really good stuff. It, then the record kind of hits a bit of a lull in the midsection and you kind of become more acutely aware of what I think the greatest weakness is, um, broadly speaking, in Russia's music at this point in their career. And that's that some of the writing 
uh, nobody's here are accepted. Some of the writing is really not up to par um, lyrically. Uh, and, and it really does, if once you try to give this record any degree of focus, which you kind of want to because it sounds so good, it's much better produced than the records that immediately precede it. But once you kind of give it that focus, I think it starts to sort of fall flat, which is why I think that uh, Leave That Thing Alone in the back half, which is I think is an instrumental track from memory, uh, stands out particularly strongly. And I think the rest of the songs that come after at the end of the record are pretty good too. Um, so I would say this is uh, a, a record that I think is underrated. Um, yeah, certainly is not... Nobody's Hero the song about uh, Getty Lee's friend who was gay? I believe it was Pierre, Neil's friend who was gay, but yes. Neil's friend. Yeah, my Neil's. Yes. Um, but yes. It's a great song. Great it's, song. It is a great song. And I, I do think this record is a tad underrated. Not underrated as much as something like Power Windows is, but certainly yeah. in the sense that I was not expecting to enjoy how this sounded and to enjoy the punch of this as much as I did. Agreed. Um, and yeah, and one more thing I want to shout out before I wrap up my segment. Um, a couple of records by the same artist. Uh, Surprise, surprise, Steely Dan. Uh, continue my journey through the discography of Steely Dan. It's not often that I become as kind of obsessed with an artist while I'm in the process of experiencing their records for the first time, as I have with Steely Dan. I listened to their record, The Royal Scam, for the first time a few days ago, uh, and it's outstanding. Uh, again, really wrinkled, knotty, um, and in dark songwriting i was pretty proud of what i wrote uh on music board for this so i'm kind of just going to recite that i think um it's like a it's a portrait of a post-vietnam usa where the last vestiges of the hope of the 60s are kind of scattered throughout concrete jungle cities you have these stories of veterans overdosing on heroin disenfranchised hippies falling out of loveless marriages and and, and, and also just kind of like immigrants arriving in America and kind of realizing the sh shittiness of what it really is. But it's never kind of like preachy or anything about this sort of thing. The writing is, is really uh, impeccably uh, elliptical and, and, and hard hitting. Uh, I'm saying, I'm just saying words now. It's really fucking good. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And then I, just last night, I listened to um, their most well-known and generally beloved record, um, Asia, which is uh, a record I had heard before when I was much younger, uh, but didn't really, I think, appreciate um, because it's, it's. I guess I, I assumed Steely Dan were like a proper rock band with riffs and shit. And I wasn't expecting what this is, which is jazz rock, heavily heavy on the jazz as well. Um, but I have to say that uh, I had a transcendental experience listening to this last night. Um, not to be predictable, but yeah, I haven't had, I've had very few experiences first, look. well, it's not a first listen, so that doesn't count, but I've had very few kind of immediate experiences where I'm just completely transported and I basically am forced to admit that this thing is fucking perfect and and it really is um and and uh yeah it is one thing that I want to bring up is that I think that today in this episode um quite coincidentally uh we're discussing uh one of the the record that I think is the, the second best mixed and produced rock record of all time which is hang cannot erase and i think the first is asia by steely dan i genuinely believe that i listened to it twice in a row once sitting on my couch uh drinking wine <laughs> like a <laughs> like the white boy i am and then i got in the car and i listened to it sort of driving around the sort of peninsula because my city's kind of like c-shaped around this kind of harbor and i just drove around the, the harbor peninsula and i listened to it and i'm like this fucking thing is like it's the fucking best sounding record i've ever heard um and also uh the title track has a saxophone solo from wayne shorter mm -hmm. uh who, there needs to be more okay. saxophone solos in general you know well wayne shorter is maybe the, one of the five greatest saxophonists of all time. You may remember him from Bitches Brew. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, anyway, so that's basically awesome. Steely Dan were at the point in their career, at a certain point in their career where they were not really a band anymore. It was just Walter Becker and Donald Fagan, and they were just kind of recruiting a rolling, um, a, a rotating circle of um, session musicians who they'd bring in, and they got Wayne Shorter and just, yeah, he, he absolutely murders the solo on that track. But yeah, um, as I kind of said earlier, uh, or alluded to earlier when August was mentioning Steely Dan, I would not recommend Asia as the record to start with from them. Uh, definitely start with Countdown to Ecstasy. But um, building up to this record, I think really kind of brought home what a significant achievement it is. Uh, really special record. Uh, yeah, and that was my week. Nice. All right, fellas. On that note. On that note, it's indeed. Time. It's time it to do this. fucking time. Let me tell you, getting an excuse to talk about Porcupine Tree is... is it's I, I, I live oh. and breathe for this shit. <laughs> and, you know, obviously Porcupine Tree, you know, they're not really around anymore. Stephen Wilson's solo work is now around. Um, uh but I think he sort of carries the spirit of the band with him in a sense, just because he does still work with a lot of uh, musicians that he worked with over the years. But let me, let me just set the stage for you and for everyone, because Porcupine Tree is not exactly the most, you know, well-known band, the most um, acclaimed band, even like they're well-regarded in prog circles and what have you. But even then, they're not a, they're not a tool. They're not a King Crimson. They're not a this. They're not a that. But uh, Stephen Wilson, main dude behind this project. Stephen Wilson has been working seriously in music since the age of 15. Uh, he has been producing and working on music in a professional capacity, like, for basically five-sixths of his life. Um... And the dude is still one of the most prolific musicians in the genre next to, again, one of my other favorite musicians, which is Devin Townsend, who is the only person who has a comparable output to him, frankly. Um, yeah, and, Stephen, and I, I think you kind of even have to give the edge to Stephen because it goes beyond simply the music that Stephen makes. His work as a producer and his innumerable... Uh, remixes and reissues of records by bands like Yes and OPF and XTC are beyond the pale incredible. He is a dude who is basically keeping the spirit of rock and prog rock alive in that respect is that he is like yeah he is remastered and remixed so many albums from so many other bands just to keep them sort of in the the forefront of like the musical consciousness uh, two of the most influential records on Stephen Wilson since he was a child were Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon and Donna Summer's Love to Love You Baby, respectively. Um, so that should give you an idea as to his musical taste. He's a very prog dude, but he's also got a lot of eccentric uh, takes. He's got many projects. He's got uh, the side project Blackfield. He has his ambient work with uh, Bass Communion. He has No Man. Um tons of shit uh he, he's got a very um uh with no man and bass comedian he has a very similar approach to shit like talk talk i would compare him uh, most similarly to um but when he started out with porcupine tree uh he started out as really the the first porcupine tree album was sort of a brit pop album really it was just the more adventurous one it was also kind of art rock kind of psychedelic um also the only porcupine tree album that is not good bad. uh it's bad. yeah it's, it's not, not really it, no it's not particularly good and then everything after that is pretty fucking great um he he basically ventured immediately into psychedelic rock with up the down stair and signify and then it wasn't till the sky moved sideways where he basically combined every possible musical facet he was ever <laughs> interested in into one album where he combined metal progressive rock psychedelic rock ambient electronic music fucking everything can be found in that album and then from then on his career was basically whatever he fucking felt like at the time 
and Porcupine Tree, while never becoming, again, like contemporary bands like Tool, who were a lot more commercially successful, um, around the time of In Absentia, which was early 2000s, 2002, uh, he was starting to pick up a bit of steam. Uh, In Absentia was also notable uh, because it was the uh, album where the drummer of the uh, incredibly uh, acclaimed progressive rock band King Crimson, Gavin Harrison, uh, joined the band and fucking became a, an instrumental it's, part of it. It's important to note that Harrison did not join King Crimson until after yes. his tenure with Porcupine Tree. Yes, and um, which is interesting because I think if you like, if you at least like would ask people who are of the know of this particular scene, people would just be like, "Oh, you know, drummer for King Crimson." Uh, they would just be like, oh yeah, Porcupine Tree 2, when I think it's basically inarguable if you listen to the work they contributed to each band that is working in Porcupine Tree is better. Um, but in 2005... Well, you mean he, was, he, he, he was a live drummer with King Crimson. That, like, yeah. Uh, at, well, I mean, their live, album work is, their, their live album work is debatably their best, but that is a completely separate topic. Um, but in 2005, we have... The release we are going to talk about right now, which is Deadwing, which follows directly off the heels of basically their <laughs> five album run that is considered to be untouchable, where we have the Sky Move Sidewaves, Signify, Stupid Dream, Lightbulb Sun, and In Absentia, all of which were incredibly critically successful, very, very well regarded records now, too. Um, but In Absentia was the first one that, like, really hit any kind of commercial success. And Deadwing actually also became pretty commercially successful. I believe it sold 200,000 copies, which was pretty good for them. Yeah, and it was their most successful up to that point, which was then yeah, quickly surpassed by Fear of a Blank Planet. Fear of a Blank Planet. Uh, so basically, this is Porcupine Tree in the middle of their heyday. This is them on their wave right now. Uh, In Absentia was a very, very well-regarded album, uh, most commonly considered their best record, so following that up was a difficult task. Um, In Absentia is an album that incorporated metal in a stronger way than any of their records had before, and Deadwing coming off of that, Steven's approach, in his own words, were to diversify the sound, is that he, in his catalog, is very aware of the fact that he's an eclectic musician, but in Deadwing, he wanted to further sort of uh, make his sound a bit more ubiquitous. And it's interesting because I chose Deadwing not because it was my best, their, my favorite Porcupine Tree album, or what I consider to be the best Porcupine Tree album, although it is not far away from either. Uh, I picked it because of the unique circumstances under which it was created. Because Deadwing is in fact really one half of a greater project that was never fully realized. Uh, Stephen Wilson and uh, one of the people who he worked with for a lot of the band's art and music videos, uh, their idea with Deadwing was to create a sort of multimedia project. It was launched uh, first with a MySpace page that is no longer available to see, obviously. Um, but there wanted to be a sort of multimedia project that was a, an album and a film. And the problem was with that is that, again, in Steven's own words, it costs a lot of money to make a movie, even if it's a very modest production. So they were really, really, really hoping that uh, Deadwing would just basically, like, against all odds, take off and make them enough money to be able to do that. And even though Deadwing was successful, they did not get nearly enough of what they did, and the project was never fully formed. Um, an entire screenplay, a treatment was written for it. This screenplay in its final form does not exist except for in the hands of Wilson himself, though the first 15 pages of the script are available to read online, which I have read. Um, more on that later. Um, but this is interesting because the album is not really a direct correlation with what the film was supposed to be. Uh, Wilson, in an interview, described Deadwing as being a companion, uh, but not a direct translation. It is something that is supposed to be a sort of... It, it effectively mirrors the mood and narrative and several of the elements from it, but it is not a one-to-one a -one comparison. So it can be treated directly as its own thing, but it also is something that, like, basically I would compare it to be, um, like, Katsuhiro Otomo's uh, Akira, 
which is basically um, the movie and the manga, which were made concurrently and basically influenced each other in their creation. That was basically mm -hmm. the screenplay to Deadwing and Deadwing the album. So then well, it's, we have. It's interesting. Can I just, I hate to interrupt you, Stuart, in your flow, but it's very interesting you say that because. I read on Wikipedia that Stephen Wilson said one of the main influences on the screenplay was Stanley Kubrick. Yes. And this is exactly how 2001 A Space Odyssey was made in concurrence yes. to the novel. It, it is a movie that was based on the likes of he cited three specific people. He cited Stanley Kubrick, David Lynch, and Nick Rogue. Um, which, if you read any of the script, it is very apparent. I will go into that more with my review. Um, but it is still something that you can appreciate on its own terms. Um, just for, like, the landscape of rock at the time, it was pretty much, like, we had just moved past, like, the immediate after-effects of grunge and were sort of moving into that sort of... When, when rock became a little bit more ubiquitous and mainstream, sort of, again, sort of like the post-grunge movement, I guess... And we, we, it, rock really hadn't found its place, so I think everything that wasn't in the direct mainstream was basically, like, not really successful, but at the same time allowed to be a little bit more adventurous while still being moderately successful, which is basically why Porcupine Tree was allowed to exist as long as they were to begin with. But then this sets the stage for Deadwing, which comes off the heels of the most successful, acclaimed, and heaviest album that they had made. And now we have that is there anybody uh, of the four of us uh, who wants to go first because i am going last because i have a very i have a very big thing i want to do with this album right so uh deadwing an appropriate title as will be discussed uh was based on the screenplay like written by steve wilson this was a ghost story as such the elegiac yet angry and aggressive tone of deadwing starts to come into acute focus Whilst the collection of influences uh, collected in this album reminds me of the Biffy Clara record, The Vertigo of Bliss, and the way it approaches prog with influences from metal and hardcore, it has a much larger tonal scope, incorporating the feelings of the spiritual and the mournful, reminding me of albums such as science fiction or The Dark Side of the Moon. Whether it's the magical influence balladry of Lazarus, the raging alt metal of Shallow, or textured nostalgic fuzz at the beginning of uh, the closer and highlight glass arm shattering, this is an album that runs the tonal gamut. Uh, that tone at the start of glass arm shattering is for me though the key to unlocking the album, especially knowing uh, this is meant to be a ghost story. While lyrics on songs like Open Car and others depict a profound sense of loss, often alluding to the specifics of the instance of loss, songs like Last Time Shattering uh, bring the emotional narrative full circle. Where you feel loss in the afterlife, slowly looking back on times once had and mourning nothing more than the passing of time and the realization that all things must pass. Wilson said the main influence on the influences on the screenplay were Lynch and Kubrick. And by the end, you feel not only the sense of glacial detachment to chaos shared by films like A Clockwork Orange and The Shining, but the ranging, burning processing of emotions shared by films like World at Heart, Twin Peaks Fire, Walk With Me, Lost Highway, and Eraserhead. The title captures the tone of the album perfectly. So not only feels like a meditation on death and the anger that comes with it, but you also fly high above reality. It captures grief in this way, both how you rage and how you feel removed from the world with grief. As no one can quite appreciate your experience, you slowly detach from the world and go further into yourself. And that experience is what this album feels like. And I mean that in a good way. That is a perfect overview of the album, I think, Sersha. That is like the the most succinct way of directly describing what is in my opinion maybe the biggest grower in this band's discography just because it is a a, a tricky beast of a record so I, I i love the way that you put that sersha exactly thank you. that's yes thank you very much. precisely <laughs> thank you well uh you know titled track uh dead wing of course kind of uh I, I love the atmosphere on it and on this album it, in general it's eerie and gives off that that ghost story-esque vibe and and you know it builds up and then you get that that just cathartic explosion into the proper rock side of this album and it's it's just such a 
a, a memorable way to start the album. And I love the way how the melody from the opening section, you can hear it throughout the song. Uh, that's a really great touch and uh, a, an interesting choice I'd, I'd like to mention about this song is, is of course, the uh, rapped chorus of it, <laughs> which I, I initially kind of hated it, but as <laughs> I listened to it more, I was like, God damn it! I'm, I'm, I've fallen in love with this. This is too cheeky for me not mm. to, not to adore. And, and then the guitar solo, towards the end of this song, is is hair raising. Uh, it, the production lends itself so well to that. And in general, I think, I think Wilson's sound brings a really. It, it sounds really clean, and brings a lot of like clearness to what you're listening to but i don't think it's something where he ever sounds sterile to me because there are cer certainly albums where you can say oh yeah that's some that's brilliant but it just sounds like robots but this is this is not the case i believe on on his stuff and that also applies to the record we're going to be talking about after this uh and and then you've got Shallow, which is the second uh, song on here. It's it's kind of this uh, properly heavy cut. I think it was a great choice for like the kind of big single off of this album. It's got that that distinct grungy flavor, uh, and it is interesting how this track. You can see early echoes of Fear of a Blank Planet in this song, and uh, like particular it's easier to talk to my pc being a lyric taken yeah directly from this i i mean i think of course it's not a central theme here so i'm not too critical on how uh less refined it is here than on that album so uh you know it's, it's still a really fun song uh and i i feel a lot of people regard wilson as quite heavy-handed maybe even corny with the this kind of writing uh and i i can agree to an extent that maybe some of uh some of his his musings about technology can come off as perhaps a little uh feel a bit old feel a bit uh Boomer? Not not necessarily boomer like, but uh, that that's kind of what I'm getting at. But where I feel for me, he completely avoids that criticism. Is what he's writing about is always so central to the human experience. It's always so emotionally charged and relatable about these themes of of isolation. It's always so pertinent that I, I never really care that it's a little heavy handed because it just works so well for me. I find it so, so deeply affecting. Uh, it, it makes up for that in strides. Moving on, uh, Lazarus stands as uh, just one of the band's most beautiful tracks, full stop. Uh, I think the narrative here is really crushing in contrast to that to the really bright and pretty instrumental of this song this story of like a, uh, as i read it and kind of interpreted uh, a mother contacting her son from beyond the grave it's uh it's very it's a tough song to process and i i quite enjoyed it uh and then Halo takes us in a completely different tonal direction, uh, much heavier, uh, and this track kind of being an attack on organized religion. Uh, and it spends, it spends a bit less time establishing a, the album's typical atmosphere, but I think that just lends to the diversity of this song within the broader context of the album here. I think it works quite well. It's a very fun song. Uh, and and then we've got the the centerpiece of the record, <laughs> arriving somewhere but not here. Uh, I I love so much of the the purpose sprinkled throughout this song and in general uh, Wilson's lyricism, uh, like how the second chorus on here cuts off 
and it's a song about death, uh, part specifically untimely death. So you get this really, really great sense of uh, just what he's doing being so purposeful. I, and that's what I always love in Prague in general, when you're, when you're making an artistic choice that has a conscious motive behind it. And that's something I always find in spades on uh, Wilson's stuff. And then uh, this is the second time we are going to be talking about a pairing of Wilson and Ackerfeld, because Mikhail Ackerfeld of Opeth fame has a solo on this song, and it is maybe the best thing on this whole record. My God, it's just so heavy. It's it's like the culmination of what this whole record is trying to do, and it's such a perfect execution of that that it's like impossible for me not to to just adore this and how and, and that's the thing wilson when he makes a long song he makes sure to never bore you like you get some <laughs> some prog artists maybe they go on too long he's just on the money this whole 12 minutes uh, next, we've got uh, Mellotron Scratch, my least favorite song on here, to be frank. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You fucking Boo suck. Yourselves. Have you considered okay, okay. that you suck? August, August, let me, let, me, let, me, let me come to your defense here. While I do agree with the other two people that I really, really love this song, is that it took me a very, very, very long time to love it, and it absolutely was my least favorite song on this album for, like, a year when I first heard it. So you, you, you're not, like, you know, I, you're not alone, exactly. It's okay. okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess, I guess just my note here is that I find it the song that I have have the least distinct feelings about on here. It's one where every other song I feel I've got a lot, I've got a, quite a bit to say about the, uh, like how it affects me, what, what it does lyrically. It, it just doesn't play as big of a part in the, the narrative of this record for me. But moving on, if Deadwing's chorus wasn't uh, wasn't rapping already, that is, uh, we've we've got Stephen Wilson dropping some dope ass bars on Open Car. Uh, it, it's a really fun song for being the shortest on here, and I and that's something I, I quite like about this album that it it's it's willing to take these like stranger ideas of like rapping with progressive rock metal stuff and it, uh, it, 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 it's, it kind of affects me in the same way as uh, Getty Lee's verse on Roll the Bones <laughs> yeah. where it, it's silly and I have to acknowledge that but I, I also can't help, help but love this, uh, this 40 year old man rapping. <laughs> And the start of something beautiful, I think, though, speaking of emotions, is just the brutalist gut punch on here. It's this meditation on emptiness and unreciprocated feelings just portrayed perfectly. Like, the chorus is just the nastiest thing, one of the nastiest things uh, Porcupine Tree have committed to a record. It is, oh gosh, it's so good. And the transitions between these tracks are really nice. There's like a small little detail that will start in the, the fade out of one, and then you'll, you'll hear that detail continue into the next song. It's a subtle technique, but it's very effective. Like, for instance, on... Uh, I mean, best example I can think of happens here, start of something beautiful into glass arm shattering. The final track on here, which is a great way to, to fade out, to kind of give us a, a coda, a fade out to this, this statement being made. Um, I, the very minimal kind of sparse lyricism on here, I think lends perfectly to to capturing the distance between the people in this track who are obviously very close to each other it's a it's a painfully relatable sentiment of 
love and trying to express that with someone, but finding yourself kind of left out in the cold, which is just what what Porcupine Tree does on all their records so well. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically what I think. It's great. I, I am so relieved because in 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 my head at least, like the thing with Deadwing is that the biggest obstacle I think for this album with other people is that like the first track through Arriving Somewhere is easily the band at their most immediate and almost inarguably just some of the best material they ever came out with. And then everything after that, which I do think is as good, is just not as immediate in the same way that the first half is. And as a result, that made me not latch onto this record as immediately as I did something like In Absentia. And I was just like, this is never where I recommend people start with this band, just because I'm like, this will be an album that you will love once you've heard like three other records of theirs and you will oh, be yeah. able to latch onto. And it sounds like you, you, you were like, you arrived at that. And I'm very, very I, thankful. Awesome. I, I will say it, it was not like an immediate process of like getting into that back half. It did take me until like my third listen before I really got started to, to, to juice that back half for all of its yes. work, but uh well i appreciate you taking the time to to do that and now remaining we have tyler and morgan which if i am not mistaken deadwing is both of your favorite porcupine tree album i've always gone sort of it's porcupine tree you know i've always kind of gone back and forth <laughs> on what porcupine tree album is my favorite the top three have always been uh, in absentia, dead wing, and fear of a blank planet. And currently, where I'm at is that um, uh, dead wing is my favorite, followed by in absentia, and then fear of a blank planet. But that could change. the The ordering could change on a moment to moment basis. But where I'm at right now, after the last couple of listens to dead wing, especially, is a place of particular confidence in it being my favorite. Um, I, I don't feel any hesitation in saying that. Uh, but I also haven't sort of really dug into the conceptual stuff behind this record uh, and their other records as much as some of the rest of you have as well. So I feel perhaps a little less qualified to really dig into it. But I just think that from start to finish, this is the most consistently absorbing uh, and thoroughly impressive technically uh of all of their records um for me there's kind of always something that maybe holds the other two back from being right at the top like fear of a blank planner i think is probably the most consistent in sound and in just being like holy shit holy shit holy shit holy shit on a moment -moment basis but also uh it doesn't exactly have um, Stephen's finest era writing wise. And so that kind of pulls me out of the experience a little bit at points, not enough to really detract from it, but a little bit uh, when I'm nitpicking and in absentia is, uh, is I think maybe the best written uh, porcupine tree album. Um, but it doesn't musically, there are maybe a couple of moments on it where I'm not as where it kind of dips a little bit. Re- again, really, this is a nitpick. But, but Dead Wing hits that sweet spot where it's like great writing and the great writing of a record like In Absentia and the consistently the consistent wow factor of a record like Fear of a Blank Planet, as well as being a record that's beautifully diverse as well. I mean, you only have to look at the contrast between something like Shallow and something like Lazarus, which the sequencing allows you to appreciate that immediately. Um, but also I think that it's it's one of the most intricate uh, records the band have released in terms of musicianship and, and variation uh, and just generally being really fucking hard hitting for reasons that only get more, you only appreciate more and more the more time you spend with it. Um, I think the opening track is absolutely astonishing. Uh, like August, I, I sometimes go back and forth on just the vocal style of the chorus delivery. Um, I don't even know that I have a place on it, but I think the last couple of listens I enjoyed it, so I'll go with that. Um, the soloing here is astounding. 
particularly the first solo, I think, which comes about four minutes into the song, I think, is, is one of my favorite Green, solos. Blue. Yeah. Hell yeah. Exactly. One of the best solos on the record. Uh, I love the way that the the riff, I, I just, the, the song has great riffs, and I love the way that the riffs kind of manipulated. You go, dun, dun, dun. It's just really fucking. God, it's like I fucking heard the song happening. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> it's really cool. And I also just love uh, opening your album with that kind of 10 minute fucking banger straight away. Uh, I, pr- prog banger with the multi, with the, the ambient part and, you know, all the different sections. And yeah, I'm in straight away. Uh, it's one of those records where, from the opening sounds of it, I just kind of get a little bit of ch- chills, kind of start running up my spine. I'm like, oh yeah, this is going to fucking rock. And it always does. Uh, Shallow is one of the heaviest songs, or one of the heavier songs in the Porcupine Tree catalog. Uh, absolutely fucking rips. Um, and then, yeah, as has already been pointed out, Lazarus is this beautifully delicate and and incredibly... Um, soulful and, and sweet and and sad song basically from the perspective of of someone who's passed away um speaking to um someone who still remains uh and and yeah it's it's gorgeous um halo is the big grower on this record for me it's obviously quite a, an immediate track but i was i always used to be kind of like mm. The, the the vocal delivery and the the, the God in the who he's a righteous soul. I was never. <laughs> I the first couple of times I heard the record, I was like, oh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. But now I'm like, fuck, this song just rules, and it's just you're 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 batting four for four on this record before you get to uh, arriving somewhere but not here, which is a song that defies description. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. I'm sure that Morgan and Jacob are going to say plenty about it. Um, I, I, uh, I want to shout out Mellotron Scratch. I tweeted just before we started recording this that it's my favorite Porcupine Tree song. And What a Tyler pick. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I get that it is. It, I, it, it's, that is in I, no way an insult, like at all. <laughs> and I agree that it's not an immediate song. Certainly was not my favorite on the record the first couple of times I heard it. Um, and this is again a point where I'm grateful to have had this record in my life for about a year and a half now Um, and it's just there's an eerie quality to it there's a real kind of sense of of I don't know haunting to it Uh, it's deeply sad um, lyrically uh, but also there's just it's wrinkly and esoteric and and it kind of sneaks up on you i think this song it kind of just i i just find myself wanting to listen to it and i don't really know why um and and it obviously has this beautiful and and deeply uh, uh eerie outro um with these we, I love we bonded it. over that moment where I was just like, oh man, this is one of my favorite things that this band has ever done. And you're just like, dude, that's like my favorite thing Stephen Wilson's ever made. And I just love, I love the vocal delivery during this outro. It sounds so kind of like, da, 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 da. it sounds really, <laughs> which, what, what are words? Which one? This is exactly, this is why I write notes because I don't do words well on the, on the fly. But, um, but yeah, I wish... I wish I could really articulate why this song affects me the way that it does. It just really... Se- Don't worry, I've got you. Okay, <laughs> it just taps into some aspects of my brain that makes me both sad, deeply fucking existentially sad and, and just warm as well at the same time. It's, it's, it's very strange. Um... Open Car is just an absolute banger. I really want to shout out. I love the dramatic quality of the, the chorus, in particular the chords and the way that it sounds are really kind of like dramatic and, and heavy and um, hair blown in Open Car. The vocal delivery sounds kind of distant and desperate. Um, this image, uh, uh, you know, of here blown or an open car of, of, of the setting that the scene that's set feels really just, cinematic yeah cinematic i guess and just kind of it's it's again another moment that's kind of sends chills down my spine 
but glass arm shattering Hush, yeah. is uh my favorite porcupine tree closer i think it is um <laughs> maybe even to to double down on my hot take it's maybe even my second favorite porcupine tree song um as and it's and i think it's comfortably the one i've listened to the most like there have been many nights where i've just gone to bed and put this song on repeat and just kind of drifted out of consciousness while it's playing and it kind of does have the quality of kind of like drifting like you're being caught in a tide that's slowly pulling you out to sea or that you're you know drifting into the afterlife perhaps more in um keeping with the record's theme it has this again ethereal and unsettling quality the way the chords kind of lilt up and down the guitar textures in this song the way that they fluctuate um it's just absolute ear candy it's exactly everything that i love about what stephen wilson does as a sound designer as a musician as an as a as a person who places tones guitar tones in a mix and and the reverb is perfect on the song on the vocals and and i just um the the lines seen it through a windscreen seen it through the glass seen it in a bad dream seen it in your heart they're so evocative of some kind of fragmented tragic thing that's kind of you know coming back to you in fits and spurts and kind of haunting your dreams like this whole thing has a really kind of hypnagogic and 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 like sleepy quality to it that just Absolutely makes me right. feel like I'm kind of drifting in and out of consciousness in a way. Do, do you really... know what the close-up really reminded me of, actually? It was a moment on the latest Avalanches where they sampled the Purple Mountains record. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Definitely, I see that. And, and yeah, I'm so annoyed. That's why it's great that there's five of us, because I can't quite articulate why Deadwing, why the best parts of Deadwing really hit me the way that they do but I just know that it's my favorite porcupine tree record and, and it's really fucking good. Tyler, don't, I, I, I want you to, I want you to not feel bad because you have tapped into something that I think is vital in the experience with Deadwing, And that is the esotericism of it in that it is such a specific vibe to it. It's just Deadwing is an angry gnarled mm. tortured sad record like even by this musician's specific standards it, it is such a very 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 specific thing and i feel like all of the songs more than almost anything else in his career are so ephemeral that they just mean mm. something so very specific to you if you latch onto this music that mm. they become inextricably linked to like your experience almost before it becomes about the music and i think that's what mm. i love about this band so much in general is that it's capable of doing that is that these songs always mean just as much to you as they do to steven mm. in, in a sense and i feel like that aspect of it is is vital to understanding all of, of his music but specifically mm. this album this is an interesting episode for me because we happen to be covering two of my top 10 favorite albums of all time by the same person. Uh, I, th I think the title track is among the, the best things you could hear for the first time from the band. Um, it immediately just feels like a complete synthesis of everything they had done so far up to this point and sort of as a result, it gives a fantastic mission statement for the band in general. And it also just immediately establishes the the mood and the tone of the album, which is like both somehow both ethereal and crushingly heavy. Like uh, it's it's difficult to describe just how well the sort of acoustic plus electric guitar intro of the song uh, when it comes when it you know, after the sort of ambient portion where it really comes crashing in and how well, just how well that mixes with the the really heavy riff that comes in directly after that. And like, there's this part of it that made me think, this is like this, this almost feels like too sporadic for its own good in terms of tone. But it's like, once you sort of listen to it a few times and you put all of the pieces together, 
uh, just this song specifically, I mean, once you sort of come to understand it, it's like, oh, that's the bit, is that it's a little <laughs> sporadic and out there. And as a result is, I think, the most interesting sound that the band had ever came up with. Lyrically, we really start to explore the concepts at play here, which of Wilson's concept albums, I find this one to be more sort of loose and interpretive, unlike the uh, the uh, the other album that we will be covering today, um, which, you know, it certainly has its moments of, you know, being interpretive. It's not exactly Tommy, you know, where it mm-hmm. tells a, a one-to-one story. Um, but like the best ones are the ones that, that kind of make you work a little bit and make you have yeah. to kind of be a bit creative with it. Um, but you can tell there's still intention behind everything. It's not just randomness. Yeah, it, it puts me in the mind of something like uh, Francis the Mute or Wish You Were Here in terms of concept and the way that they explore those. But yeah, if, if there's a sort of, you know, very literally ghostly feeling evoked by the lyrics throughout the song. And even, you know, when it's quote unquote rapping. And, you know, there's a little bit of Wilson, you know, getting on his We Live in a Society high horse, but, you know, that's why we love him. But primarily that works just because he evokes so much emotion and specific uh, imagery within the concept of this album and the song specifically. And funnily enough, I think it goes. The reason I have trouble saying that a band like Porcupine Tree is, you know, not as, you know, progressive as the artists that they are clearly indebted to, as some people on the internet music criticism scene would like to imply, is because I don't think there's been quite a a synthesis between metal and rock in the way that songs like Dead Wing and Shallow do because i think they explore so many facets of both progressive metal and progressive rock across the two examples in particular where it's like you know what what else sounds like this you know there are obvious tool comparisons to be made with in absentia and dead wing and those are certainly uh places of inspiration for wilson but like you know you're not going to hear anything on a Tool album that sounds like the pre-chorus to Shallow. You just won't. And it's it's asinine to reduce it to such a level. So much when so Shallow that it does is, sound like a Tool song, it sounds better. Yeah, that's that's another thing about that. Um, it's, it's why I find people so willing to write off Wilson as, you know, just a... Uh, basically as a glorified tribute artist to be so frustrating is because they're like, you know, they're not really paying attention. But yeah, Shallow. Uh, clear lead single pick for the album. Um, and I feel like as a result, it kind of, as the most accessible song on the album, I feel like I kind of reduce it a little bit to like the quote-unquote enter Sandman of the album. But like, <laughs> This is only because I've heard it 5,000 times, especially within the context of the album. And that's it's sort of an instinct to do that with an album that's indebted to progressiveness as an idea. There are some songs that are like perfect melding of everything that an artist would try to do in like a very small window of time. Um, you know, we, I, I got at that some with on the title track is like this is sort of a a synthesis of everything that they were trying so far uh but shallow i think is that to such a degree in such a small uh frame of time comparatively that it just becomes a brand new sound for them altogether and it's songs like shallow which give deadwing its strongest points of identity i believe Production credits on the album as a whole go to Wilson, Gavin Harrison, and Richard Barbieri, who are the uh, Harrison and Barbieri being the drummer and uh, keyboardist of the band, uh, respectively. And, you know, as much of a genius as Wilson is, as we know him to be in terms of production, 
and mastering. Uh, I think Harrison and Barbieri's contributions, not just on this song, but on the album as a whole, uh, absolutely cannot go unsung because I think they're essential to the sound of not just this album, but Porcupine Tree in general. And I, I find them to go a little... Uh, a little under the radar in comparison to Wilson's contributions. Unsurprisingly, Lazarus is another excellent uh, example of this. Uh, this was a song that took me a while to get fully on board with, just because I found it to be like a little too saccharine compared to you, the rest of the album. You told me that as soon as you heard the album that you were, like, you just texted me and I just remember getting your text in the middle of uh, college and you're just being like, I just do not fucking vibe with this shit at all. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a fucking, you know, we've all been 18 or 17 once. We've been stupid oh, yeah. before. I mean, I gave um, this album a 7 when I first listened to it. We were we were all dumb. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's just... What makes so much of Lazarus work, and this is especially apparent now that I pay more attention to things like production and mixing, is just how immaculate every layer of it sounds and is mastered and mixed. Because, um, you know, it's, it's essentially a pop ballad on, mm-hmm. you know, this progressive metal album. <laughs> uh, but, like, it's, it's perfectly played and pitched for what it wants and needs to be and every layer of it is just so immaculately realized that it's you know it just works um any accusations of it perhaps being saccharine or corny i think kind of falls short when you realize how immaculately performed and uh produced it is but also when you really dig into the the lyrical content of the album and you listen to just how much conviction Wilson and the rest of the band lend the song. And it also in that sense sort of perfectly fits in with the rest of the album as it's sort of one moment of genuine... Emotional (laughs) authenticity? Well, I mean, the whole thing's emotionally authentic, but... I guess. I mean, there are some songs that are more maybe more vulnerable than others, even though everything's very authentic. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Lazarus is really the only truly emotionally vulnerable part of the album. Uh, the rest of it is mired in anger and uh, resentment at the loss of the uh, protagonist's life. And Lazarus, mm-hmm. I actually think, in my interpretation, is from the viewpoint of the deceased mother uh, instead of the other way around. Um, And I think it's the sort of... It's the only moment on the album that changes the perspective and sort of contextualizes uh, what it's like for the people around our protagonist after they have disappeared from their uh, plane of existence and moved on to the next, Um, which I think is an important thing. It lends emotional context to the protagonist and the world they lived in before and after they passed away. And I think that effect would be lessened greatly if, you know, the song were to sound anything like anything else on the rest of the album. Mm. So that's, it's, it's definitely a journey that I had to go on for myself a bit there. Next track, Halo, puts me in mind of, funny enough, Nine Inch Nails, even though this is not an yeah. industrial track. It's just so dense with various production idiosyncrasies, like the, the vocal effect on the goddess freedom, goddess, goddess truth portion of the verse. Frankly, I just think it's brilliant especially because the whole song is just propped up by Colin Edwin's absolutely filthy bass line. Oh my God. <laughs> which is so like good. one of the greatest bass lines that I've ever heard in ever. And it's, and like, it's another thing. 
it's worth mentioning is just that everyone, everyone in the classic Porcupine Tree lineup he is here and operating at the absolute peak of their powers. Harrison is as tight and rhythmically interesting and inspired as he has ever been. Edwin is contributing the most in terms of face work than he ever has. Wilson is just, you know, go. he's, he's the obvious, you know, ringleader of the group and is just going as hog wild with ideas as he can. Uh, Barbieri has never been from a sound design and keyboardist perspective, never been more inspired, particularly on tracks like Mellotron Scratch and arriving somewhere, but not here. But I think part of the reason that I ultimately decide that this is my particular favorite Porcupine Tree record is just that it's kind of the most Porcupine Tree record. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, I tend to prefer Wilson at mm -hmm. his most maximal, you know, his moments of restraint are interesting, but sometimes I can't help but feel that they're kind of just diversions from what I really want out of him. That's what Prague's um, all about. Yeah. But it's like, just give me the most of you that you can possibly give. And, you know, Halo in particular is nothing if not that. So, yeah. Now we arrive at the centerpiece of the album, uh, the 12 minute opus of Porcupine Tree's career, I believe. Arriving somewhere, but not here. Where, where, where to begin? Really? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't even know how to do this without being hyperbolic, because this is one of the 10 best songs I've ever heard in my fucking life. Embrace yep. hyperbole. Just yep. do it. Yeah, yeah. Go hog wild. Like, Fuck it. Yeah, from, from the beginning of the song, the atmosphere is untouchable. Like, just the ambient soundscapes that Barbieri and Wilson uh, create in the sort of the first two or three minutes of the song. But once the sort of coarse, soaked 12 string acoustic electric guitar sound comes in, the main hook of the song, it's, I, you just, but, uh, like, what? <laughs> it's an extraordinarily <laughs> simple hook and lead line, but it also is like the most eerie thing I've ever heard in my life. And as, as a, at this point in the album, it feels like a culmination of everything that Deadwing itself has been going for. And the slow and steady atmospheric build that it maintains up until it, the drums kick in and it really just comes to full life is one of the, it, it, again, I, I've heard the song probably in the quadruple digits at this point, and it never, never once even comes close to losing its impact. It is just so geniusly arranged and composed within the realm of progressive rock or metal that it, like, I, I, I think Aliens created it, and <laughs> uh, Porcupine Tree was simply the vessel through which it was channeled. Melotron Scratch. Oh, boy. What what an odd beast Melotron Scratch is. As much as shit as I liked to give August for his take on it, I only came to the conclusion that this is one of the better... One of the better... It's all tens. Um, <laughs> one of the better tracks on the album after, like, four years of having heard it and having listened to it frequently... It's one of Porcupine Trees and Wilson in general's most sort of idiosyncratic songs in general. That's why I really respect it as a uh, best Porcupine Tree song pick, um, just because it encompasses so much of their specific voice. I think also a part of it is like, it sounds quintessentially Porcupine Tree, but also it sounds totally unique as a song within your discography. Like, I, I don't think, I don't think there's any other song they've ever made that, that 
does no. what the song does for yeah. me. Um, it's um, just totally unique, which is why I, I I come back to it so much specifically because I can't get the feeling it gives me from anything else. I cannot help but agree. Open car is just like one of the most. I hear the phrase quietly devastating used a lot to describe art. Um, usually, it tends to be an apt phrase to describe a lot of things. So it is here that. With open car, I coined the phrase uh, "blisteringly devastating." <laughs> it's you know the it, perhaps at first listen where you're not really paying attention to lyrics and you're just sort of observing the song as a musical motif. It's just like this, just shreds. It's like the heaviest thing I've ever heard in my life. The the central riff that comes in after that first verse is like one of the most remarkable things I've ever heard anyone come up with, with within progressive metal. Uh, it's, it's a riff that I learned to play and it's like, I don't know how anyone thought of this. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to like sit down and that's what comes out of you. Like, how did you do this? Especially in comparison to the, the verse that plays in the riff that plays in the verse of the song. It's like, it's in an interesting time signature, but it's very straightforward. And then the the riff itself fully blisters in, and it's just like, what? How? And lyrically, I think the song is Dead Wing at its most vindictive, and um, I would almost describe it as violent when paired with the song itself and I find that a really fascinating emotional viewpoint to come at from the afterlife it's often a really sad thing when someone takes the perspective of death or someone who has passed on or even the people left behind after they've passed on and it, there are moments of deep melancholy and sadness on open car specifically and but the the primary emotion that i come away with here is rage that life was stolen from someone and whatever afterlife that they're they're living in now is a, it's like there is no escape even after death from the kind of vindictive rage that can come from certain emotional events that happen in life which you know as has been mentioned is existentially crippling like if i sit here and think about that for too long i, I like I, I won't get out of bed for the next <laughs> three days start of something beautiful explores that in a far more restrained and atmospheric perspective which i think makes it a really nice chaser from open car that's where quietly devastating comes back into play because it just it hurts the more i show the way i feel the less i find you give a damn the more i get to know the less i find that i understand innocent the time we spent forgot to mention we're good friends you thought it was the start of something beautiful we'll think again it's like all right steve Fine. You know what? Fine. Just take every single petty, immature emotion I felt at heartbreak and youth and put it into a song because that's something I need to relive. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I guess someone could knock it for being less mature than some of Porcupine Tree's uh, musings on various topics in life but i think the perspective of like someone who died young and is very you know you know has some words and thoughts about that is i think really enlightening and refreshing glass arm shattering is easily the most lyrically sparse track on the album um perhaps in porcupine tree's career in terms of non-instrumental tracks and I think that's why it, that's what makes it as brilliant as it is. 
I view it as a sort of, Tyler, I love that you mentioned that you have put this on while going to sleep before, because that's something that I've done with the album about a million times now. Um, listening to Glass Arm Shattering when you're like in that sort of half state between conscious and unconscious is like better than any drug I have, anyone could ever take, I think. So much so that it almost induces that state in listeners if you're familiar enough with it and is like one of the most genius closers to any album I have ever heard in that regard, especially considering the context. Deadwing, uh, in the many years and the long journey that I've been on with it as a whole, has definitely changed how I think about music in general. And it's just the GOAT. This is a remarkably special album for so many reasons, and I already alluded to one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it being the mysterious and strange way that it came to be as this sort of multimedia art project that never became fulfilled. Um, not that I am going to claim to uh, represent that or anything, but in listening to all of these albums, in compiling what we do know from all of these things, from what we do know of the screenplay, from what Wilson has said in interviews, I have, in my rough estimation, approximated what the narrative of Deadwing is. And I feel only more validated by that, because each single segment you all have mentioned something about the narrative that is super duper specific that is also 100% right and completely coincides with what I have to say. Even, in fact, curiously, Tyler and Morgan's contradictory reading of Lazarus. Both of you are right. Uh, I August love being an English teacher. <laughs> August and Tyler both mentioned that there seems to be a, a presence of a, a motherly figure uh, specifically on the record, too, um, which, yes, there is. Very important. Um, just lots of very, very specific details that, like, even though you're not trying to piece together the narrative, are inevitably very, very much there. And while, again, this is not a direct translation to the script, as they said, um, it is, in their words, to be a, a translation of the feeling. So I, in my relentless pursuit of trying to find narratives and albums, because I guess that's what I fucking do now, um, I have done so. And every time I have done my best to, to read uh, other people's interpretations of it online, as scant as it is, because, you know, a band like Porcupine Tree doesn't get talked about in a band, or in an album of theirs, like, Deadwing is, while acclaimed, not as talked about as Fear of a Blank Planet or whatnot, and every time I've read a wall-to-wall -wall interpretation, there have just been things that I have fundamentally disagreed with or feel like people are being too vague with. So, uh, I will attempt to do my review and translate what I seem to uh, say is this narrative story um uh premise wise uh what we do know uh about the story is that it i believe the main character's name is actually david which i think might even be spoken at one point during the track list but i'm not entirely certain but uh the main character yes it is my david uh, don't you worry yes there we go um, the main character named David is an ADR and sound mixer for films. And the opening of Deadwing is sort of a bait and switch. Uh, in the script, it's described as, like, it, it's described sort of like an art house movie. I mean, like, it very much gives me uh, Nick Rogue vibes, as Wilson uh, intended. And there's this point where it stops and then rewinds very quickly to be everything that we just saw, and then it's, it's, a, it's a match lighting. 
except it's a different sound than we heard the first time. And then the exact same thing happens a third time. And this is like a, a breaking of the fourth wall moment where we find out that what we have been watching is in fact a movie that David, the main character, has been editing. And he's trying to find the right sound effect to do for the, the match lighting. And he tries to find it and, you know, that's what happens. So basically Dick, that is I wanna, how... I want to stop you right here and just say that I know you haven't seen Blowout. <laughs> and what I'm about to tell you will hopefully finally convince you to. <laughs> because because that is the opening of that film what you just okay, described well yeah there we go um also uh basically what happens here is that it is described as a ghost story and this is very concretely like i am i have not said anything that i am going to theorize about yet um basically what happens is that david over the course of working on this film is haunted he keeps seeing the specter of a young boy who keeps appearing in places that he shouldn't both in the film and in reality he lives a very droll kind of existence a very kind of fight club thing where you've got the main character who's you know living in this kind of malaise and uh, a lot of it, too, um, is inspired by Jacob's Ladder. There's a lot of imagery that has to do with um, the underground trains sort of thing, like, because, you know, Stephen is obsessed with trains. But it's also just that's kind of where the more textural horror and psychological elements come from. Uh, he's also seen, like, going through the city, traveling from place to place. We see parts in the script of him observing conversations between people, yada, yada, yada. But... Um, he, he keeps seeing that, and there's also uh, a woman who is very important to this story who uh, keeps showing up in, in reality, who uh, David is probably uh, romantically attached to in some form or another, um, but from a, from a distance, just because he's very lonely and, and antisocial. And the idea with the specter of the young boy is that he is, in fact, David. He is David from... A younger perspective and what's going on throughout the story is that a specter version of his younger self is sort of haunting him and as implied with a lot of the influences of this movie the movie gets a little wonky with its interpretation of reality so in Deadwing um, basically uh, the young boy younger version of David is like a different timeline um, there's also lots of references, uh, uh, obliquely, kind of, but also directly, especially in the titles, to um, cars. Uh, and very specifically in Arriving Somewhere But Not Seer, we seem to get a very vivid description of a car accident. Um, and also throughout the entirety of Deadwing, there is a past trauma that is alluded to multiple times from the main character's perspective that affected him. Uh, this being a, an accident where his parents were killed. And basically his life from then on was permanently um, changed. And Morgan said something fucking perfect that I basically had to hold my tongue on, where one of the songs captures um, a sense of rage at a life not lived, basically. And that's the idea, is that the ghost specter version of this main character of Deadwing is him in another lifetime where he did not experience this past trauma that David is angry at. He is projecting. He, is, he sees this little kid as something who stole something from him. Uh, the, basically, uh, the, the life that he is jealous of that he did not get to live uh, and also, this is where we get into less concrete things and more of my theorizing, having to do specifically with the mother character, um, which has been alluded to multiple times. I, in my opinion, um, well, I guess this is less in, in my opinion, David's job um, is that he's a, he's a sound mixer. He's trying to sort of, uh, he's like a sound editor, he's an ADR guy. He interprets the world around him and 
life in general through sound and music, which is mainly told to us in Arriving Somewhere But Not Here, where he processes all of this trauma and all of these things through the sounds that they make and how he hears them. And so him becoming a sound editor is his very futile attempt to try to control the world because he feels a sense of helplessness. This also leads into the, the significance of the mother character and the absence of the father character. This is slightly where I am diverging from more concrete details. Everything that I have said so far is basically rooted in indisputable fact. Um, here's where I get more interpretive, but in my opinion, David had a strong connection with his mother and not his father. Uh, his father was absent. It is directly stated in one of the songs that his father never wanted him, and his mother uh, lost her uh, figure, basically, for him in having him, um, but had a connection with her. And you can see that there's, like, a connection that's brought up, a maternal one that he keeps coming back to that he remembers. The thing that probably he values the most and views as important, the thing that was stolen from him. And in my opinion, his mother, at least, was, in fact, a musician. And that is why he interprets the world around him to be with sound, because the most important relationship in his life was centered around music. It is also very quintessential to understanding that this is a very Stephen Wilson-ish concept, because the dude, again, has been working in music since the age of 15. He is a very weird, very idiosyncratic dude who basically lives and breathes in the artistic medium and doesn't know how to do anything else. His entire career, Porcupine Tree, every single album, there is, it is rooted in one idea, and that is loneliness. He has been distanced from all of reality and has had nothing but music to fill in the gaps for him. So I think this is a little bit more personal than it might let on, but, you know, that is a little bit more of an extrapolation. But these details are important. Um, it's also what makes Mellotron Scratch a very, very important song narratively. Now, <sighs> all that said... Uh, you have the title track, which, uh, words to describe Deadwing. There are many of them, uh, one of which has been said many times, and that is ethereal. Um, one of the most prevalent instrumental ideas on this album is, in fact, the progressive rock signifier of the Mellotron. It is fucking all over this thing, uh, maybe more than any other Porcupine Tree album, and it wails. It is an ethereal sounding thing that sounds absolutely sublime, especially here. This track, as I won't dwell on just because it's more of a setting the stage kind of thing, a tone setter, but also a, just a very meat and potatoes kind of song that everybody else has already gone into, and I don't want to repeat anything, but it's a it's quintessential. It's structured immaculately. It goes really fucking hard, but it's also infinitely beautiful, and it's, uh, it's just a stellar piece of progressive rock and progressive metal. Um, Shallow is the next song, which, you know, complete banger. Uh, it's a song that's so gnarled and angry, it sounds like it is trying to tear itself apart. Um, it details more of the main character's isolated existence in the city that he lives in. Uh, the main character, the ADR jobber for the film, who lives a frighteningly empty existence and is starting to see supernatural phenomenon manifest around him, including meeting a strange woman and seeing a young boy. Um... Uh, the woman is a manifestation of his latent sexual desires and repressed loneliness. Uh, the other is the boy who is the past version of himself, and he's trying to reckon with something that happened to him, and sh that changed the course of his life forever. Maybe something traumatic and slightly repressed. Um, then we have Lazarus, which is really the most, Im like, not most important, but the first real notable narrative event on the album. And I think this is a communicative song that is between both the mother and from David. We talked a lot about the idea of sort of singing from the perspective of being disjointed from reality when we talked about Phoebe Bridger's Punisher, sort of a uh, slaughterhouse five kind of pull back fourth dimensional view of a story. And that's 
pretty much exactly what's happening here, which is why it would lead to an, in a sort of mixed interpretation of, oh, I feel like this is uh, from the mother's perspective to David. Oh, this is from David's perspective to the mother. It's actually about both. From a verse-to-verse -verse basis, it is the son talking to the mother and the mother talking to the son. They're both just on different planes of reality. Uh, it changes the tempo of the album spectacularly. It's a really, at its heart, it's a piano ballad that's backed by an acoustic guitar. Uh, he beckons the, the lost soul who was tragically taken, which takes him to this otherworldly valley, and it has all of this immaculate prose, like moonlight is bleeding from out of your soul. It's a pristine and achingly beautiful song that eventually has these honestly kind of sunny electric guitars come in it has it's this moment of clarity there's this uh, reassurance here rest your weary head upon me i have strength to carry you it places the the value that david had in this relationship uh in this song and it's why it's so important to him uh it's an intersection between uh understand it's an intersection and a moment of understanding between a lost soul and the main character, the lost soul in question being his past self, a reckoning between the two, um, the two of them and a moment of euphoric realization after the first two songs just sort of root you in that existence, that loneliness, that mundanity, and that's why this song hits as hard as it does. Uh, you also, sort of at the end, you hear the ambient sounds of trains, and you do throughout the entire record, which is, again, it's sort of indicating what a lot of the uh, movie would have taken place in. Um, then we have Halo. Uh, Halo is an interesting song, because this is where, at least by what I read it to be, is that after this supernatural experience, and once David is, like, aware of what is happening to him, he briefly becomes overwhelmed and almost possessed by the supernatural phenomenon he's witnessed, saying that he's got a halo around his head, uh, and this mantra-like voiceover and this odd vocal delivery. Uh, the main character is obsessed with this because of his life being so empty previously, and now begins to see God in everything, which is why the refrain of God is freedom, God is truth, God is power, God is proof, and he sees it everywhere. Uh, and the song itself is like a total rager. I think Morgan put it best. The bass work in this song is fucking godly. Uh, and it's, it's just a banger of a rock song. Um, then we have, of course, the, the incomparable, the superlative, Arriving Somewhere But Not Here, which, again, if this was any lesser band, I would say that this is easily their best song. But, like, again, top three, I can't come down whether I think that... Uh, way out of here, this or Anesthetize is their best song, and I will never come down on it because they are three perfect pieces of music. Um, but Arriving Somewhere But Not Here is interesting because he basically said the title of this song is the theme of the movie in an interview. Uh, it's the main character feeling displaced because of what happened to him in his past, something that stole a proper existence and life from him that he does not have. It begins with this ghostly beeping, like there's a Morse code message being sent in the song, and a somber guitar melody that sort of leads into this intro. Uh, and then it details the events of the car crash. Never stop a car on a drive in the dark, the first line to me, just sort of reflecting on that particular event. References to cars and tragedy can be found all over the album, leading me to believe that this is, in fact, the, the source of David's pain. Never look for the truth in your mother's eyes, uh, next sort of implying that parental connection that's referenced every so often. The Mellotron in this song slowly comes to life, right after the mother being mentioned, which I think is a very obvious thing that will be made clear on the next song. Um, it has this mysterious, anxious atmosphere, and it goes on to detail the rest of the events of a car crash. Um, in the middle of the night, specifically, did you imagine the final thing you'd hear was a song, a reference to the car radio? 
uh, I think this line holds more significance than one may initially think. The whole idea of Deadwing, um, the end of this song is about displacement, timelines that will never be, and the feeling of being stuck in existence that you feel is not yours. It's no mistake that the main character is a sound editor. I think the designation is to imply that his job is him grasping at a futile attempt to control his life after it being derailed. Uh, being in control of sound design after music has become emblematic of the thing that ruined his life. Then you hear something interesting, which is, did you imagine the final sound was a gun? Uh, it's another line that seems curly, curiously out of place, but arriving somewhere but not here is not a linear song, nor is Deadwing a linear album that is not rooted in a progression from A to B. It is fourth dimensional. It's already hinted at that the main character is isolated, angry, lonely, and depressed, and clearly has some unresolved issues regarding something that happened to him, the car crash in question, and the subsequent death of his parents. But the final sound, once again emphasizing not the actions themselves, but the sounds that they make, which is further characterizing him, vital to understanding how he processes the world. Um, he's thinking of taking his own life, as he recalls this, with a gun. The song is asking him uh, if this is the way he saw it happening. Uh, it makes this song a reckoning again, a crossroads of the narrative. And that's not even to comment how musically ambitious this whole thing is. The acoustic guitar passages, the roaring electric guitar breakdowns, the swirling psychedelic passages that weave it all together. It is just... It, it, basically, this is what makes Porcupine Tree special. Instrumentally varied, but musically focused. It is a song that is purely constructed out of 100% ephemera. You can tangentially compare this to other sounds of uh, other prog and prog metal acts, uh, the likes of contemporaries, maybe Dream Theater, Tool, Shades of Early King Crimson, or Jethro Tull, but no comparison is quite apt. Um, None cover all of the bases. Uh, for the entire duration, you occupy the headspace and world of this character that you may not even realize is being relayed to you. Later, it hints further at his sense of helplessness. All my designs are simplified, all of my dreams compromised, hinting at that inner anger that he doesn't get the life that he wants. Uh, lyrics that are enforcing the how he refuses to let go and how the future... Uh, and timeline in which he didn't suffer, he views as being stolen from him. The song speaks to a part of me that often feels displaced, of being in a, a space that you know isn't where you feel you're meant to be, and how it feels like you're dislodged from reality itself. It is transcendent, and its placing on the album is essential. Wilson not only knows how to make songs like this, but precisely when to sequence them so that they remain their most emotionally effective. This song displays every bit of their sound, their late-era prog metal, their early psychedelia, their mid-career art rock, and it all swirls together in what is indisputably one of the finest moments for a band with no shortage of fine moments. It is vicious, mournful, exciting, but it is also meditative, and it further and further lulls you into its distinct mood. One of the song's final lines ties my interpretation of the song and record overall together. Did you feel the envy for the sons of mothers tearing you apart. As if seeing children and their mothers itself is painful for David, as he envies the connection and love that they have that he views that he lost. I would wager to say that the final minute of this song is the most beautiful a Mellotron has ever sounded. And speaking of Mellotrons, Mellotron Scratch has a curious beginning with a splashing guitar and a steady drum line. Then the bridge comes in. The Mellotron seems to be harmonized and multi-tracked with itself, making it sound like a chorus of ghostly wails that's just chilling. The song refers to the sound of a Mellotron making a woman the main character knows cry. I would like to posit that this main character's, uh, that, er, that the character in question is the main character's mother, yeah. who may have been a musician, with fur which further emphasizes the main character's connection to music and why he views yeah. the world the way when, he does. When, when you said that before about um, the main character's mother being a musician and that being a kind of focal point of the relationship, it, it, I just immediately pulled up the Mellotron scratch lyrics and like it just clicked why why that feeling was emanating from the song, but I couldn't explain it. 
it's it's why even after all these years this is something that i have only put together in like the last week or so listening to this album which makes me feel like i have unlocked a fucking puzzle box which like it's not integral to enjoying it as you hell have all no doubt proved at this point but i do feel it's still there is an emotional narrative Jake, that's... every everything you're saying is is gonna is fucking making me appreciate this album so much more. Thank you. And like the uh, whole the thing about the car accident as well, I feel like I, I I knew that on some level, but not consciously. And it makes the lines in Glass Arm Shattering about seeing it through the windscreen, seeing it through the glass, seeing it in a bad dream, like that makes that make oh fuck. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so glad that I'm on track here. Yeah, continue. Um, we know it, the beast. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, it emphasizes the main character's connection to music and why he views the world the way he does. But uh, why in the song the woman is depicted to spend time with the main character while hearing the Mellotron, and the song is a melancholy reminiscence of the character recalling his first connection to music, further explaining what he does as a sound manipulator, a desire to control how he sees the world and to connect with what he's lost. When the song revs up with this gnarly guitar passage, and then the final minute comes in, which, as Tyler has no doubt already put it, is one of my favorite musical moments Wilson has ever made. These chaotic vocal harmonies swirl together around the aforementioned ghostly wailing Mellotron, looping in on in themselves over and over again. And this is one of the points where the album is just, it feels like it is possessed by an otherworldly spirit. Words simply do not do it justice. You simply have to hear the moment where the instruments cut out and it's just the vocal harmonies for the remainder of the song. The lyric being spoken here also backs up my read on the song. Don't look back into, don't let the memory or the sound drag you down. Leading me to believe this song is the main character attempting to directly confront the spirit of his departed mother after the realization he has on arriving, and she encourages him to not let music or his memories of her be tainted by the tragedy that they suffered. Yeah. Open Car. This is an edgy, violent-sounding song that recounts a sexual encounter between the main character and the mysterious woman that he keeps seeing. In it, his observations and remembrance is scattered and manic. He develops feelings for her that he's hiding, painful ones. I'm getting feelings I'm hiding too well. Bury the heart-shaped shell. Something broke inside my stomach. I let the pieces lie just where they fell. Being with you is hell. His dislodged psyche fantasizes about a relationship, a timeline, with her that he will never have. Seeing her in a summer dress in an open car, trying to paint over his idea of the car crash in his past with something beautiful instead, as a way of band-aiding the situation. It's the only bright and summery image the album has conjured up so far. His experience with her is haunted by what he wants it to be instead of what it is, and it becomes hellish to him, as he knows it won't ever mean as much to her as it does him, in a desperate attempt to connect emotionally. In fact, I read this song very similarly to the song on uh, The Meadowlands by The Wrens, um, uh, 13 Months and Six Minutes. It's basically the exact same thing. It's just in a distinctly darker, edgier kind of way. Then we move into Start of Something Beautiful, seamlessly transitioned from Open Car, which leads us here, which is basically the most important part of the record narratively. It is the main character reckoning with the spirit of the child that he keeps seeing, which also, I feel, ties the whole story together. He states the child is always with him in his thoughts and dreams, and that he's a part of him. Mother lost her looks for you, father never wanted you. The absence of the father figure on the album being reinforced here is never wanting him to begin with, the further con uh, and furthering the connection with the mother. This song is him realizing the identity of the child as his past self, but also an externalized version of himself that he wishes he could go back to, to maybe try and live the life that he views that he lost. 
The second half of this song is positively orgasmic, with the distorted guitar line at the end that just sends me to another fucking planet. Then there is Glass Arm Shattering. Lyrically, the song is scant and simple, and it shows the main character finding solace in the love and connection that he feels from the parts of his past that have manifested through this entire ordeal. He looks back on his past through the car window and the life that he never got to live through the windscreen, seeing and touching only the beauty but not the tragedy. The peaceful and gentle balladry of this track implies achieving a sense of balance and a quell to the inner conflict that's been wrought over the entire album. It's not in what he's lost, but the unique bond that he's formed with what he's lost that keeps him going from this point forward. And basically, that's Deadwing. And I feel this profound attachment to it, not because it's this detailed story with all of these things in it, but because it evokes this story without giving you all of these details. I had to look and piece this shit together through shit I had to find all over the internet. I did shitloads of research. The MySpace page for this doesn't fucking exist anymore. <laughs> it was fucking difficult, but thank God for Reddit. But the emotional connection that I have to it is every bit as poignant as Morgan's or Tyler's, and the time that I've spent with it I think is invaluable. And it's only my fourth favorite record from this <laughs> band! What the fuck? And then you throw all the Stephen Wilson records. And... How, how, how does someone do this and make me love this mm -hmm. thing in this way and get this passionate about it and basically chronicle what this story that we're never going to see ever is mm -hmm. because I wanted this segment on the podcast to be like the only chronicle of it on the internet that exists, which from my telling and my research it is, but that's why this album just fucking owns man it's it's ephemeral it's beautiful and there is just simply nothing else like it not even in the band's own discography uh any final comments or shall we move into our uh final assessments ratings and mm. favorite tracks uh, i think we should do that all let's right go. let's do it then um jake why don't you go first we'll go in normal order Man, 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 oh man. Three tracks from this album. I am going to say my three favorite tracks are, of course, Arriving Somewhere But Not Here, Deadwing, the title track, and if I... This is an album that is literally so good, I almost contemplated saying that I have no favorite tracks and that I have no least favorite track, just so that I could eschew the idea altogether. But I say my third track will be, in fact, Mellotron Scratch. Uh, I have no least favorite track. And after four long years, for the first time, I came to the definitive conclusion that I will finally give Deadwing a 10 out of 10, as it has sat as a 9 for the past two years, and I will finally is... rectify it. That's ah! correct. Alright. Well, uh, favorite tracks here are uh, the opener Deadwing. Um, I'd have to say uh, Lazarus and probably Arriving Somewhere But Not Here. Least favorite, as stated, is uh, Mellotron Scratch, and uh, I'll give it a nine. Mm. Morgan! Mm. Uh, my three favorites. They were uh, they're arriving somewhere, but not here. Uh, fucking uh, Mellotron Scratch and Last Arm Shattering. Uh, my, it's, it's no least favorites. Don't be ridiculous. Uh, ten. My three favorite tracks are Lazarus, Halo, and Glass Arm Shattering, and giving this album a 10 out of 10. Mm. Mm, it's so good! Mm. That's, good for, that's good for the soul. Yeah. Tyler. Yes, my three favorite tracks are Mellotron Scratch, 
glass arm shattering and arriving somewhere but not here uh i do not have a least favorite track this album is a 10 out of 10. Ooh, oh, and yeah. an average of 9.8 oh, it does <laughs> Holy no one needs to know. Shit. <laughs> Holy fucking shit from five people. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, going out from five people. I this is a, has a nine point This eight. is officially, officially the uh the highest record all five of us have reviewed together. It is number nine you know what? out wait, of wait, wait. everything. Nope. nope, I we're uh, I'm making this moment better. You okay. know what? Just for no. the occasion. I can't don't toy with me. Oh no. Okay. Ten. Yes. Oh. Yes. Get in. Oh. 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 Let's oh. let's do it. Let's oh. do it, boys. Oh. We thought this moment would never come. I'm I'm not letting this I'm not letting this pass me by. We, we thought the moment would never come, and now I'm I not have. letting this pass me by. Okay. Oh. And it's a porcupine tree album. Oh, oh baby. Oh. Uh, what? It's an average of 100 out of 100. <laughs> I need to change my pants. I did. So, we did it. Collectively, <laughs> the number one record we've ever reviewed. Fucking Deadwing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, yeah. You know what? It, it deserves it. I'm, I'm not going to front. Mm. Cheers, I everyone. I'm going to front. That's lovely. It That's was. Yeah. It was always, in in retrospect, it was always going to be Stephen Wilson. It, it truly was. The, <laughs> and the, boy, the boy, are we not done yet. Let's fucking go. So, we've talked about a, a canonical record uh, from the Porcupine, Porcupine Tree, and, and we've talked about Steve, the significance of Stephen Wilson as an artist to us, and I'm sure you'll hear, still hear more about that to come. Um, but we wanted, one of the things that I thought was so cool about um, taking these two separate ideas for a record club that we had, which was Dead Wing and Hank on a Race, and combining them together, is that in celebrating this artist, you get these very distinct snapshots at different points in his career, exactly 10 years apart as it happens, that together paint a really uh, more detailed portrait of what makes him so great and what makes him, his music so significant and emotional and a manifold um so we moved to his uh i want to say fourth stu su solo it's studio correct. record hand cannot erase um and yeah so i want to introduce the album conceptually i think it's important to establish the the real life background of the album and the uh and, and in so doing it established the concept of the album itself in march of 2001 an english woman by the name of joyce carol vincent resigned from her job and moved into a domestic abuse shelter little is known about what compelled her to uproot her life completely outside of the fact that she was in an abusive relationship but in the two years after this dramatic shift she became estranged from her family moved into a flat owned by the Met Metropolitan Housing Trust set up to house victims of abuse and was rarely, if ever, seen or heard from again. On January 25th, 2006, Vincent's remains were discovered in her bed sit only found after housing officials repossessed the property after two years worth of unpaid rent had accrued. Her date of death was placed around December of 2003, just over two years ago. Her remains were described as mostly skeletal by the pathologist. No one, not friends or family, had seen or heard from her in years. And Stephen Wilson's Hand Cannot Erase is a concept album based loosely on, loosely on around Miss Vincent's life and tragic death, telling the story of an unnamed female protagonist that go from recollections of her youth to her death in a similar manner to that of Vincent's. So that is context established. Okay. Real barrel so of laughs we've gotten ourselves into here. Oh, yeah. We're, I mean, from Deadwing and this, Stephen Wilson, cheery bloke. Um, 
I am going to be uh, talking about it first just because I have sort of a rough outline of the record and what I read it to, at least what I read some of the songs and lyrics to be about in a very cursory kind of way, so we can fill out the gaps a little bit here. Um, album starts with uh, First Regret. Sort of begins with a, like a ambient sound of rain. You can hear children playing in a city setting. Gentle piano kind of sets the tone. And I think what's interesting here and that we um, briefly touch on at least in comparison to at least Dead Wing, this is, you know, there's about 10 years of difference between this record and um, uh, the record we just discussed and how, like, and you know, clearly the tone is really not all that different considering how dour the subject matter of both is, um, but the actual, like, aesthetic of the records are so miles apart. The Hand Cannot Erase is a completely different branch on the progressive rock tree that uh, Deadwing is. And Deadwing also is just very much, you know, it's very much a porcupine tree project, and this is very much a Stephen Wilson project. And for every bit as much as those two things might intercept, I do think that the distinction is quite notable. Um, because uh, Hand Cannot Erase is, is brighter. Hand, Hand Cannot Erase is, like, vivid and and clear but also very it's it's also has a lot more of an electronic influence on it and deadwing is like this gnarled kind of ugly thing and they're they're, they're light years apart uh which i think shows his uh, stylistic versatility um the record properly begins with uh, three years older song that starts out with this rather joyous and kind of resplendent guitar line and like bombastic drums, immediately reminiscent of, like, golden era rush in, like, the best possible way. It's nice to hear how up-tempo and, and bouncy it is, just because, generally speaking, it's just not something Wilson and Co. do super often. It weaves in and out of these different guitar passages very, very spryly and changes melody in very subtle ways. Um, eventually becomes more of a simple acoustic ballad when the first lyrics come in. Uh, you cross the schoolyard with your head held down and walk the streets under a breaking cloud with a hundred futures cascading out. It's complicated. You think of love as just a memory, a fog that smothers you. It's hard to breathe. But when you're on your own, that's when you're free. You're three years older and you'll always be now. I feel this song and this lyrical passage is meant to introduce to us the main character, but also to embody a sense of youth and possibility. A hundred futures cascading down is a direct reference to this idea. It's this idea of being young and first breaking into the world of adulthood. There's a hint of darkness here by saying that love is just a memory, but it's nothing more than a suggestion of things that everybody has to leave behind when they grow up. This is a bright and optimistic new start. Uh, but on your own, that's when you're free. And I just love the sense of frankness and humility Stephen delivers these lines with. His emotional vocal deliveries on this album are versatile and incredible. Uh, however, as the song goes on, there is something more here, foreshadowing that this story will lead into the world slipping away from the lead character. She makes a list of regrets from her past that she can't quite let go of, even though the love that she felt before is, again, just a memory. There's something frightening on the horizon. The breakdown at the end of the song is just fucking vicious. It is a great musical mirror to the theme of something more being on the horizon. Then there's the title track. This song is mainly about the connection the main character does eventually seem to form, be it with a friend or family member, or someone that they view to be family. Uh, there is a solidarity that they share together now that their new life has begun. Um, occasionally saying that they do miss home. Occasionally that they lie to their friends and family about being happy all the time. Again, things that you just sort of do that come with living with life on your own. Saying that it cannot be erased. A key line that hints at things to come, because trust means we don't have to see each other every day. Something that plants the seed for what will fester later. The song itself is one of the more traditionally structured and forward tracks. The tasteful electronic elements and bright guitars make this feel like a ray of light. 
uh, then we have perfect life. Uh, this begins with a really off-kilter ambience and steady, careful electronic drumbeat. A spoken word curiously says, When I was 13, I had a sister for six months. She arrived one February morning, pale and shell-shocked. From past lives, I could not imagine. She was three years older than me, but in no time, we became friends. We'd listen to her mixtapes, Dead Can Dance, Felt, This Mortal Coil. She introduced me to her favorite books, gave me clothes, and my first cigarette. Sometimes we'd head down to the Blackbird's Moor to watch the barges on Grand Union in the twilight. She said the water has no memory. For a few months, everything about our lives was perfect. It was only us, we were inseparable. But gradually, she passed into another distant part of my memory until I could no longer remember her face, her voice, or even her name. Once you know uh, Joyce's story, this sort of makes sense as beginning with a strange line, which is, when I was 13, I had a sister for six months, which, when you think about that for more than two seconds, it's like, well, what the fuck does that mean? And it's like, well, this is obviously someone who came into their life like an adopted kind of thing, or like taking in someone uh, who was likely living in a shelter, as she did. There's an unsettling tension in this song that at first, it's, it's notably darker and more melancholic than what came before it. And those metallic drum hits are harsh. It is the turning point where the darkness that was hinted at previously now blossoms. It rings as a song about denial, of doing your best to convince yourself that your life is perfect when it's actually slipping away. Stephen's gentle insistence of the song's title, We've Got the Perfect Life, over and over again, feels deeply sad. It's like a scene from a film where you see visible hints of sadness creeping in on our lead. Days passing by, dreariness, but the song's beautiful intoxicating production and occasional strings make it all feel tinged with beauty. The beauty that we cling to in order to maintain that veil of perfection, perfectly illustrating denial. Then... We get to routine. Hey, fucking... Fuck you, Steven. I hate you. <laughs> I, this fucking song. It, it's ruinous. It, it is an achingly despondent song detailing what it is like to get lost inside of a routine in order to keep yourself going when your life is empty. It is perfectly illustrated by the amazing animated music video that you absolutely should watch, but you can get uh, everything you need from the song in question. Now, Morgan, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the female vocalist here, is that Ninette Tayeb? Or is that another? Okay, it is. Uh, a frequent collaborator of some of Wilson's stuff and candidate for the most beautiful voice on planet fucking Earth. Um, Stephen and her contribute vocals to it, but, uh, Ninette Tayeb, uh, sings from the point of view of the main character. Routine keeps me in line, helps me pass the time. Concentrate my mind, helps me to sleep. It is a song that brutally captures the slog and monotony of depression, being alone, performing tasks like you're a robot. The structure of this is flawless becoming bigger and bigger as the isolation gets worse and worse. It is a song that never stops being hauntingly gorgeous, even throwing in some subtle woodwinds into a few passages, but never loses its firm grasp on its tone. It is an achievement, both narratively and sonically, and both vocal performances are absolute showstoppers. The guitar solos on this album are uniformly excellent, and the one in the middle of the song here is no exception. The lyrical passage that follows, uh, uh, that is notable to me, is the last one that Stephen says after Nanette delivers her final lines, which is, The most beautiful morning forever, like the ones from far off, far off away, with the hum of the bees and the jasmine sway. Don't ever let go. Try to let go. Don't ever let go. Try to let go. Don't ever. And it stops. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, um, I also I can, have I, to... I concur, Tyler. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I also have to note um, the moment near the seven and a half minute mark where I think there is a very clear homage to uh, a very iconic moment on Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon with the vocal delivery. It's basically, like, inescapable, and it sounds fantastic. I mean, obviously, it's a big influence on Wilson. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm... <laughs> Jesus. Um, the next song is Home Invasion, which begins startlingly as one of the first songs that really begins in kind of a jarring way, uh, with these terrifying shrill string passages that somberly echo into nothingness. The guitar begins to mercilessly throttle with this staccato riff, and the drums gradually roll into this menacing build into the song proper. And mm -hmm. this song, in its content and lyrics here, very, very reminiscent of Halo. Download sex and download God. Download the funds to meet the cost. Download a dream home and a wife. Download the ocean and the sky. I've lost faith of all... Of, I've, but I have lost faith of what's outside. The only stars across the sky. And the wreckage of the night. This entire song becomes dizzying and otherworldly as it's this representation of using the internet as a surrogate for the experiences and reality that you want to have. And, I mean, if a song is more patently getting to the core of what it feels like to, to put yourself into the internet in a way that's very revealing, in a way that's very honest, it's, it's this one. I mean, who the fuck knows that better than the five of us? The, I mean, seriously. And that's, it gets to the heart of what we were talking about on Deadwing, is that Stephen often comes at these subjects and topics that, you know, it can come across as man yells at cloud, but here it's rooted in emotional honesty. It is someone who is trying to escape, and the internet is that escape. And one of the artists that is most influential on Stephen Wilson uh, is David Bowie, someone who was also fascinated with the internet and its possibilities, but he saw it as a sort of convergence, uh, uh, an optimistic thing, whereas Stephen has always seen its potential for darkness throughout his entire career, which is manifesting perfectly right here. It's sort of a, a more modern twist on this song that's, you know, I mean, we've had to live the entire last year of our lives doing this shit. The fact that it took me this long to truly connect with this is, I mean, it's sad, but it's also worth it. Just because the shit that we've had to endure in the past few months, it, it makes everything on this album hit with so much more ferocity. Regret number nine, it's seamlessly transitioned into uh, the song title itself, a reference to the list that the main character compiled. The keyboard playing here at the start is absolutely sumptuous. The, this particular electronic tone pushes the buttons in my brain that give me the good chemicals. I don't know how to describe this shit other than it is good sounds that make my brain happy. Uh, and the actual playing itself is undeniably impressive. Um, again, very 80s rush right here. Uh, I love how it becomes a quaint little, what I think is a mandolin ballad at the end. It's, it's gorgeous, whatever the fuck it is. Transience uh, begins with a very silky guitar passage. The way Stephen layers his vocal harmonies at the end with each lyrical, um, with each passing lyric uh, at the very end. Instrumentally, this has a very big Wish You Were Here, Pink Floyd written all over it. This song always struck me as a brief reprieve, a pleasant dream, but also a temporary escape as you remember a better time, a recollection of a better memory. Uh, at the, fail at the failing of the day she heard her father always say, Remember, it's only the start. When she drifted off to sleep, she had the world at her feet, because it's only the start. Before they fell away, it seemed a matter all the same. It is only the start. Ancestral is a 13-minute long titan of a song that is... I mean, this is the guy who made it arriving somewhere, but not here, and he just basically did that song again, but, like, it's just as good, if not better. 
It begins with this watery electronic timbre and dry percussion. Discordant piano notes float around Stephen's distant echoing vocals. Then a fucking flute breaks in, of all things, along with some strings. And God, man, the lyrics here... <sighs> Come back if you want to and remember who you are, because there's nothing here for you, my dear, and everything was past. When the world doesn't want you, it will never tell you why. You can shut the door, but you can't ignore the crawl of your decline. Come back, child. Go back if you want to. I read this song is about her being lulled into the sleep of death. At first, it is a gentle lullaby. Everything fades away, and she dies alone. It is beckoning her, but the part that makes this absolutely devastating is the final lyrics. Come, child, go back if you want to. But she doesn't. She's given the option to stay there and live, but instead she actively chooses to die and be forgotten. Two lines that pack far too much emotional devastation than any short amount of words ought to. The absolutely fearsome guitar work here is some of the best in the medium of music. It is one of Wilson's most progressive and structurally ambitious things he's ever made. Happy Returns, the next song, I either interpret as her final words before she does finally die, or, more heartbreakingly, her from beyond the grave, not having realized that she has died from the monotony of her life. This is some of the most razor-sharp and emotionally painful writing ever put into a song as it is framed as a letter to a relative. Uh, the final moments, Hey brother, I feel I'm living in parentheses. And I've got trouble with the bills. Do the kids remember me? Well, I've got gifts for them. And for you, much sorrow. But I'm feeling kind of drowsy now. So I'll finish this tomorrow. <sighs> and the album ends with Ascendant Here On. Uh, the final instrumental passage. It sort of loops right back into how the record starts, hammering home the tragedy of the loss of life. This is a cycle where she will never be noticed or found and the world will keep on spinning. And the only thing I have to say broadly about this album, other than it being a perfect capture of what it is like to feel all of these things and to do this is that I, in some respects, I can see this as being viewed as like the brand new song Limousine in that if someone was emotionally close to the subjects of the song or the album and they listened to it and felt uncomfortable, I would not be surprised. But in a way, I feel like this is like a desperate calling forth of Stephen being like, I'm going to let this person be seen. This woman was forgotten. She did not deserve this. She deserves her story. And this is her story. And to back away from this topic, um, that idea, as I touched upon in the Frightened Rabbit episode, the idea of remembering someone who was lost is something I find deeply powerful and to be one of the most meaningful and beautiful things you can do with a piece of art and it's incredibly moving and inspiring that he chose to to do this in the way that he did and yeah i, I think this is just undeniably an impressive achievement on all fronts but Emotionally, it manages to be the most ambitious and beautiful thing that he's made across his entire more than 30-year-long career. So, I, uh, I suppose that runs into me with this album. Uh, album opens with this uh, just rocking instrumental in the form of 
first regret which uh in general all three of the instrumental tracks on here just do a fantastic job at either upholding or uh no establishing or reaffirming the kind of tone of the song that comes before or after them so much so that i i uh i think the best way to evaluate said tracks is kind of combining the instrumentals with another song on here as is done on I think pretty much every digital version of this album and yeah. perhaps the physical version, but I can't speak for that. I think the assumption on Wilson's part is that, you know, if you're going to buy this on vinyl or CD or whatever, you're going to listen to it all the way through. So, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I think Not, when I think when tracks kind of transition into each other seamlessly, that's clearly the artist indicating that they want you to consider them of a piece. Yeah. Yeah. No. Or like at least at least consider them to be presented within that order. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, wh whether it's yeah, like one song or not, but regardless, uh, three years older as kind of the proper album opener here is. Uh, it's it's monstrous. It seemingly bl seamlessly blends these pounding guitar riffs with just these soaring stratospheric synthesizer sounds. It is such a a cool heady technical piece to start it off. And as Jake has already pointed out, uh, very in contrast of the tone of the actual lyrical content here, which I think is immaculate uh being just the the perfect encapsulation of the pressure associated with just a, a a point in one's life where you have to just ask yourself what comes next i in this song it's it's used very much in the context of like uh, kids, a, a child deciding what they want to uh, be when they grow up, and um, I find myself at a, a cross section in life, or intersection rather, in life where that that's a very uh, hard hitting point for me. Just the, the this song does such a great, and I'm going to make a specific uh, reference to like it, it feels what it's like having to to sign up for colleges and stuff and like put down what you want as your major like i just it's like being at a point where you just you you want me right now to just sporadically click a, a button that's gonna gonna put me down this path for the rest of my life it's just that that terror and that pressure that I, I feel so beautifully encapsulated on this song. Uh, I, I love the way this, this song is structured too. Like there's this, there's this great moment where uh, when, when Stephen first delivers the line, uh, and you're three years older and you always will be, where the, the lesser musician would explode into their giant loud guitar chorus and just chug on forward with the track, but instead he chooses to take the opposite route and, and dial things down, tone it back, and, and give you this very beautiful piece in the song. I, I love the way that not only it's done on this song, but I feel that's just a constant throughout his career. This, this great ear for, for just the construction and building of songs and doing things in a, in a way that doesn't feel entirely typical. Uh, one, one thing I do have to note about this album in general is I did find that the programmed drumming on here was a bit weaker than the like actual live recorded drumming on here. I thought the most particularly the sound, I thought the programmed stuff sounded a little stiffer, a little less. And I mean, of course, because it's programmed a little less kind of energetic and lifeful. 
it, it kind of depended on where it was placed on the in in this album. Sometimes it worked exceptionally well for me. Other times I just I, I would have preferred he went with something else. And yeah, but the live drumming excellent. Don't have complaints there, uh, as per typical with Wilson. Even though I I don't believe this. Uh, yeah, I don't think this is Gavin Harris. This is. Uh, it is not. Yeah, I don't know who it is, but he's also quite good. Uh, Marco Miniman. Yeah, that yeah. One. yeah, that guy. He's pretty good, too. Uh, perfect Life, I think. You know, so it's, it's a really interesting point where we've got this, this spoken word piece. A, I mean, the, 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 the audacity of this man to just do so many things which should not work and yet he's able to make like rapping spoken word pieces work over over progressive rock and the way this this glides into the refrain at the end is just so haunting i love the way the the melody in the song kind of leads you into that it, it feels like such a a logical direction for this song to take it's 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 like a really cool routine is routine is something special uh, a a painfully relatable sentiment of using habit as a coping mechanism in the face of tragedy uh, i i think it's something that everyone with a soul can relate to and this is where i think it's important this album comes from a female perspective because you get this very motherly maternal sense of of our protagonist where she's talking about just washing her children's clothes while they're gone uh and how that that habit just takes her through here and i think it's i think it's a really cool point in his discography and a, and a neat change of pace for for wilson to do this uh ancestral has just one of the sickest guitar riffs on the whole record i mean in terms of outright progressive rock uh the way this song uses reuses and incorporates elements is just crazy particularly the flutes on here introduced at an earlier point you get a guitar section before that and then you get a section afterwards where they're combined it's it's just great and that's about what i thought pretty good yeah. nice i was already familiar with the story about this album of uh joyce carol vincent uh due to the uh 2006 mockumentary not mockumentary docudrama directed by carol morley uh, who maybe is more prominently known for uh, The Falling or her other docudrama, um, Carol Morley, The Alcohol Years, which is much more autobiographical about her alcohol problems. Um, in this film, Joyce Carol Vincent is portrayed as dying whilst wrapping Christmas presents. I don't know if that's true, but it adds to the emotional dimension to the story. Um, and yeah, um, if... It's, it's also not, like... A, a, a one-to-one adaptation of her story. It's, sure, I know. It's really just a jumping-off point of. Yeah, like obviously there's stuff in this that Stephen could never know about her real story that he's read into it and put onto what is essentially a starting point for a story that relates to one single real event, which is someone dying and being left for a long time. Um, if it, I referred earlier to Deadwing uh, as comparable to uh, the Vertigo Bliss. If Deadwing is the Vertigo Bliss, Han cannot erase reminds me very much of uh, Only Revolutions in that, be that in that it's an epic, sweeping narrative of striking grandeur and emotional vulnerability. The oh, hello. Um, the opener matches the tone perfectly, going between piano balladry and uh, ripping guitar math glory to Pink Floyd-esque melodic shredding. Stephen gets to show off his amazing self-harmonization on um, beautiful acoustic tracks that build and build and build and build. Um, 
I just want to say, Wilson knows how to mix his voice better than anybody knows how to mix their voice. Um, sweet Jesus. Um, Wilson looks on almost from a, a God's perspective over the life of the central character on this album, um, expressing life for her, expressing a lot of love for her, despite the tragedy that will befall her, looking omnipotently on her story and sort of bestowing romance on her mere act of being alive. Um, the second track builds up such a beautiful sense of hope with an almost like pop noose um, about hooks and production that sounds shiny and glittery and fun and hopeful and emotional and accessible. It is just some of the most transcendently joyous instrumentation I've ever heard. Perfect Life has bleak and punishing instrumentation. It seems to capture that sentiment uh, Carol Morley was hitting at with the title of her film, Dreams of a Life, where the existence of someone is portrayed uh, by the swimming in your own memory and then out of it again when they die. The point of death being the point at which a person is forever consigned to a distant part of the memory, quote unquote. Yet routine uses minor pianos and dark lyrics like, uh, what do I do with all the children's clothes? Such tiny things that still smell of them. To evoke the sense of loss that comes after the point of death. Keep cooking, keep cleaning is a line that's used in the song that uh, I think it simultaneously captures a feeling of like an emotional death where you're going through the motions after a tragedy that I think, again, anyone with a human soul can relate to. Um, but also refers to how life carries on after death as perfectly exemplified by this story. Um, after that line, though, it explodes into emotional climax. Um, the most beautiful morning forever is a line that stopped me in my tracks because it just captures this sort of permanent stillness that comes in death, which is why I think this story resonates with people and Stephen Wilson in that it's like the perfect allegory for, for, for life is this death. And I think uh, that line, the most beautiful morning forever, really captures that in that it's this beautiful life he's conjured out of fucking nowhere, stopped in its tracks. And we can, and this album is like celebrating that life, but forever. And it's, it's, also the fact that this person was fucking dead for two years, alone and still. This album is much less frequently um, a rock or even metal album than Deadwing, or even the other Stephen Wilson album that means a lot to me being uh, The Raven Who Would Not Sing. It's not until Home Invasion, 50% of the way through the album, that it sounds to me like what I expected it to sound like, uh, being more of a traditional prog rock or metal record. Um, and even then, Wilson is constantly experimenting. The way I regret number nine crescendos into a purely instrumental way uh, is that of a master for a gives way to mournful pianos and what sounds to my ear, to my ear like a banjo. Uh, the song Transients, though, goes right back into folk balladry with intricate guitar lines following the melody and uh, there are raging synths straight out of the Blade Runner score that add a level of foreboding intensity. The chorus then breaks into more of the, the previous pop magic and hooks the mirror of the album's most hopeful moments. It's almost like the tone itself becomes a light motif for the celebration of this person's life. Ancestral gets right back uh, to prog though, although it still maintains a sort of uh, balladry, I suppose, with an absolutely heartbreaking song that acts for me um, as an act of tonal storytelling more than anything, uh, bringing us towards a heart-rending intensity as we climax the record. The addition of an orchestra and hard as nails drumming aid this epic suite of a song for, it, for its first five minutes building it to a climax before it pulls off the same act twice more by the end of the song with each crescendo getting more impactful than the last. Here, Wilson Song transcends genres to just deliver a heartbreaking story on this album. Yes, it's a prog rock album through and through, but it incorporates so much, so many ideas, such a broad scope for such intimate storytelling that uh, you could, and I did a few times, listen to this record without any context or knowledge of the story behind it or attention to the lyrics and get the same emotional journey. 
This is nothing short of spectacular music making at a level of skill, ingenuity, and sincerity you will find in very few places. I loved it. I loved it. Yo! I'm super stoked that you developed the emotional attachment or emotional connection to it that you have um, because yeah i have an interesting story to tell about this album and it has not been okay. in my life for very long um well not really a story i guess it is a story i guess i can turn anything into a story um <laughs> anyway uh so it's really interesting with stephen wilson because and with artists in general that that we all bond over because uh i know that i introduce i, I know that i've introduced many of you to artists that you may not otherwise have heard that you've developed a connection to and i get a lot of you know obviously you get a lot of sense of pride out of that like the connections that we've made over artists like frightened rabbit and twilight sad and i and it's always lovely as well when you guys uh, i guess introduce me to an artist that i either wouldn't otherwise have heard or maybe would not have otherwise taken as seriously and Opeth is a great example of that. Um, countless other artists. But it's especially fortuitous when there's an artist that I, that isn't super like at the front lines of popular, of music loving, but that we independently fall in love with and then happen to connect over. And Stephen Wilson and Porcupine Tree is probably the best example of that. I discovered Porcupine Tree in early 2019 before I really knew Jake or Morgan or either or any of you. Uh, I discovered them, actually, I might as well give this piece of information out because I actually discovered them through our mutual friend, Generic Orange Soda, uh, who- Shout out. Shout out to the soda. And they brought uh, Porcupine Tree to my attention long before I knew Jake or Morgan. And I found the love with them. That's also how I met you, technically speaking, is the yeah. porcupine tree. Yeah, but it was nice. It was nice to have this artist that we kind of independently fell in love with, but that ended up anchoring a lot of our of what we connected over. And uh, I give all of this. Um, I, I make this point that that Stephen Wilson was someone who I did discover independently, despite being so deeply tied to Jake and Morgan, because uh, I think that uh, Hand Cannot Erase is the best album Stephen Wilson has ever been involved in, in any form. Yes. Uh, it is, I like it. I have grown to love it more than any Porcupine Tree album. I've grown to love it more than any of the Opeth records that he's directly involved with. Anything that he has had a hand in the creation of, I think this is my favorite. Um, and it was not that until yesterday. There's the way this often goes, isn't it? Like I, I actually, this was the first album, my first, first listen of 2021 for me. I listened to it on New Year's day and obviously I loved oh, yeah, it immediately. Yeah. Uh, I, I saved it for, I was saving it for a special occasion and I thought New Year's day of this year was the right time. And I loved it immediately, but like all, all like many great records, especially ones that have a concept like this one has, it really took a while to unravel it and really appreciate the finer details of what makes it so good. Like the first time you hear this record, I think you're just swept up in how it sounds and how yep. rich it feels. Um, and you're just listening to have the crispness of it and you're just admiring it. And um, uh, it wasn't until last night, I already, earlier in the episode in our, what we've been listening to, Special. I talked about how I had a transformative experience listening to Steely Dan's Asia last night. I went out the, I went out for a drive and listened to it while driving around the harbour around my city. And when that record was finished, because uh, I was like way out, way out of here. Uh, <laughs> when that record was finished, I put on Hand Cannot Erase. Uh, and I just thought, okay, I want to, it was like 10 p.m. summer night, um, clear sky, watching the moonlight on the water and and hand cannot erase was playing and it just was one of those perfect time perfect album moments where it, i was just 
absolutely awestruck by every single second of the album and everything about every single second of it. I was waiting for a second that I wasn't in love with and it never came. <laughs> the hour, and the album is an hour long. Um, um, yeah, I just the opener uh three years later first we're getting to three years later is just outstanding prog it's older three years sorry three years older outstanding outstanding prog uh i have little to say about it that hasn't already been said it is uh um um, again one of stephen wilson's many marvels of prog songs structuring and construction the way that the heavier sections um interrelate with the more dreamier sections and yet the heaviness and the dreaminess of it both of these things somehow hit harder than they ever have before in steven's discography and i think it's a testament to how immaculately designed and mixed the record is um there's a real kind of serenity and and pureness to the way he sings i can feel you more than you really know i will love you more than i'll ever show um and it it sounds somehow i feel somehow even closer to stephen in that moment than i had ever felt on any similar moments of soft beauty on earlier records of his um hang cannot erase the title track is uh one of the most beautiful songs i've ever heard in my life uh, it is a perfect pop song, and I cannot say I was ever expecting to hear such a perfect pop song on a Stephen Wilson record, but Jesus Christ, it's um, it's just flawless. Uh, perfect Life, again, is another sort of curveball with that kind of vaguely industrial and, and distorted beat and the spoken word over top of it. But I have to say that each of these elements and the way they come together is like, it just, it's like someone found the neurons in my brain that like release the chemicals when I orgasm and just put it into a song. Like everything about the way this sounds and and also obviously the spoken word itself, the story that is being told, the the images you're getting hints of, the the and especially the tangible emotional connection that you can feel in the way the spoken word is delivered as well. It's not just kind of emotionless. It's like a real sense of of connect of of getting a uh, moment of connection into the story. And that's another thing that I particularly love about this record is the way in which. Uh, the c- certain moments where Stephen steps aside to let other voices uh, embellish the songs. And I've obviously nowhere is that greater scene than routine, which, um, so I said a Mellotron Scratch was the best Porcupine Tree song. This is the best Stephen Wilson song, including any Porcupine Tree song. Uh, to me, anyway, it's my favorite uh, <laughs> It, I, I absolutely openly bawled listening to it last night. I had to pull over because I couldn't see. <laughs> it was that bad. And it was like, it, it, it starts out so softly and with the piano and it just kind of, uh, it gradually establishes an emotional core that just gets ramped up uh, with as the kind of mundanity but importance of the routine sets in and, and it's become so entrenched and and the central character becomes so reliant upon it you feel the you truly feel the weight of a lifetime of of of, of pain uh in the vocal tones on this song um i again haven't i haven't spent enough time with this record to know the names of the um additional vocalists on this record um but whoever they are holy fucking bananas um routine has a climax unlike anything else i've ever heard in 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 a song uh in terms of sheer emotional impact and uh the ability to continue leveling up without feeling like uh it's somehow cheapened or or i don't know it just feels so emotionally pure and cathartic it's it's astounding uh and then to go into the doomy opening riff of home invasion and 
and that's such a, a, a gritty track that I really love uh, coming at this point in the record and going into Regret 9, which is just outstanding um, guitar tones. Uh, Transients is a, is a perfectly placed interlude and ancestral. Uh, it's better than arriving somewhere, but not here. I know Jake said right. that it's at that level, but I have to be honest with how I feel right now. And I think no, that I agree. I actually yeah. think that it's, um, I think it's the, the solo is by, uh, I forget his name, Definitely Guthrie Govan. Yeah, I wanted to shout that out as well. Uh, his solo specifically is um, probably the best guitar solo I've heard in anything that Stephen Wilson yeah. has made. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, I, again, I have to tie this to a specific experience. It was like the moment that started, I was, I was, I was leaving a sort of town on the outskirts of my city and I was, I came around a bend and I was just um, driving along this incredibly like straight uh, stretch of road that just went on and on and on uh, without the slightest turn. And I just like, I felt the car accelerating as the solo was starting and I felt myself leaving my body and it's so cliche and stupid. And I know we say things like that for effect and it's funny when we do because that's just the way we are. But legitimately, I don't know that, I don't know how to describe <laughs> what physically, physiologically happened to me when I was experiencing that, but it was something else. I, I'm not gonna lie, I totally uh, exceeded the speed limit multiple times while listening to this record. Oh. Uh, Hell yeah. <laughs> and I am while we're while we're being confessional as well, I probably shouldn't have done this in the first place because I had did I was drinking wine when I was listening to Stevie Dan earlier. But I don't care. I had the best experience I've had listening to music in the car in a long time and I won't do it again. Sorry, Mum. Um <laughs> uh, it was only one glass, fuck off. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I had a glass of water um anyway uh yeah so that's basically where i'm at uh i don't want to take up too much time because uh other people have and i will continue to describe in much more detail than i prepared uh but yeah this this album uh is is sensational expect to see it in my top 25 of all time the next time i update it yeah. uh i and what's so beautiful about that is that I was not expecting my relationship with this album to deepen and, and grow to the point that it has. Um, for some reason that surprises me, but I guess maybe because I've got so much entrenched in those core Porcupine Tree records that I just had dismissed the possibility that anything uh, from Stephen Wilson could outshine them for me. But, but this is an album that I, unlike those Porcupine Tree albums, which I can listen to generally speaking most of the time, I could see myself putting this on at any given moment and being able to listen to it front to back without a care in the world. Uh, and and it's, it's truly a testament to Stephen's ability uh, and just the, I guess, in a sense, the kind of kindred um, relationship that, that he has with each of us and just with the people that enjoy his music in general that he's able to tap into a very specific emotional quality of progressive rock and progressive metal that is to me the defining quality of what makes the best acts uh, in that sphere of music as important and affecting and necessary as they are and of course it is the quality that many of the acts that get mocked or that aren't as effective lack uh, in that specific sphere as well. Um, and Stephen Wilson understands that emotional quality and he understands the power of, of sincerity in that regard. A lot of, um, a lot of kind of naughty, progressive or, you know, more esoteric genres of music can get caught up in, in, irony or or that or like meta awareness of the of what the genre is or what's trying to happen and, and stuff but this is a record that's just unabashedly sincere and loving and full of life and and it's to me 
obviously it's not the only Stephen Wilson record that displays these qualities to a certain extent, but it's to me the most consistently uh, embracing of them. And it's no surprise that uh, due to that, it's the one I connect with the most. Um, but Deadwing is, a, is, a, is an incredibly close second and I love that it's ended up being purely coincidental for me that the two records we talk about today are the two top ones for me. Um, and uh, yeah, that's really all I have to say. Good gosh golly. Yeah. Yeah. If you're listening to me read this review, it's likely that the story I have relayed, that of Joyce Carol Vincent, is information you're already privy to, to some degree or another. Establishing context for the concept of Han Kanata race is absolutely integral to understanding what makes it tick, perhaps more so than any other concept album similar to it. I believe the best concepts album, concept albums don't rely on their concept to be as great as they are. Ideally, you can properly listen to and absorb a concept album and absolutely love it without ever digging into its thematic qualities. Hank Cannot Erase is certainly an example of this. I was head over heels for this album before I was even aware of its concept. But as for my relationship with it now, it is absolutely integral to understanding why I believe it to be one of the best, one of the three best albums of the 21st century thus far and one of my three favorite albums of all time. But before that, it's best to unpack what the album actually sounds like uh, before we dive into the wellspring of thematic material at play here, as I didn't come to the conclusion that it's one of the best albums of the century just because the concept is so engaging. The first thing one notices about Hank Not Erase is just how incredible the compositions are, how extraordinary the playing on the part of everyone involved is, how pitch perfect the mixing and production are, how emotionally invocative evocative and powerful it all is, even at its most indulgent and quote-unquote noodly moments. <laughs> Progressive rock is often accused of being emotionally vacant, oriented solely on technical skill and lacking in properly compelling reasons to listen outside of the occasional need to pick one's jaw up off the floor. But if one were to say the, al the album in question's emotional beats rang hollow, even if they were just referencing the compositions and not the lyrics or concepts, I would say that they simply didn't listen. Stephen Wilson has always been an emotionally forthright songwriter. The majority of his songs serve not to dazzle you with proficiency, though Lord knows he and his various bandmates have definitely done that a time or two, but to wring as much genuine emotion out of the listener as possible, even at his most indulgent moments and in soundscapes absolutely engulfed in atmospheric synths and mellotrons or guitar solos wailing at a fever pitch with the most obscene technical wizardry heard outside of a Mayo Vishnu orchestra album, Wilson's intent is always to evoke thoughts and feelings from you. To me, this is what makes and cannot erase his finest work across any of the monikers that he's created and produced al albums under. His intent, his intent remains more or less the same across all of his work, but to me, Hand cannot erase the pinnacle of emotional power within his discography. Every musician on the record is operating at the height of their respective powers, none more so than Wilson himself. As a composer, I think he has never been more inspired, producing sections and elaborating on ideas and motifs that at, at a level I, at the risk of sounding hyperbolic, could only call genius. His playing on the record, which varies from the lead vocal duties to production to playing the hammered dulcimer, isn't far behind his compositional work at all. I think he's never been more impressive as a vocal presence and his rhythm section contributions form the backbone of the album's instrumental framework. And it's this confluence of inspired technical genius and deeply powerful emotional resonance that comfortably puts Hand Cannot Erase in the upper echelon of progressive music across any generation. It is both musically and emotionally maximal without ever becoming overwhelming on either front, a line very few artists across any medium have ever properly written. But at the risk of somewhat contradicting myself, I could wax lyrical about how sonically gobsmacking this album is for years, and anyone with the, with the knowledge of Wilson's work could go on for just as long as to why In Absentia or Insurgence is just as brilliant, if not better, than Man Cannot Erase, and be no less wrong than I am. 
the fact is that Wilson essentially operates on this level about 95% of the time he's making music. And within that percentage is where one narrows down their personal preference. So as long, for, so for as long as I could and have gone on about his genius, the only thing I can truly relate to you as a listener of this podcast is why I think it's amazing. And to do that, we have to unpack the whole thing. And giving, it, giving it any less than that would sell both the album and my feelings on it short. Hmm. The album begins with an atmospheric instrumental centered on creating a soundscape in, when, in which one central keyboard melody plays. It's the kind of in introduction that can only properly reveal itself on, sub on, eh, on subsequent listens when you know what comes after it and can realize the confidence it takes to start an album bursting with this much passion and sonic creativity with something as minimal as first regret. But even on first li listen, it's not hard to tell what an achievement of sound design it is. I really don't know how to describe it beyond the fact that it just sounds amazing. As, as we soon find out, this is only the warm-up of the album. The first pro proper passage on it, three years older, bellows three years as a larger, more developed sense Mellotron sound employing the motif of regret, followed by shimmering acoustic guitar chords. In case you hadn't picked up on it, the album has actually started now. The passage that follows is nothing less than an orchestrated cavalcade as Wilson's lone acoustic guitar is joined by massive synth soundscapes, bass that just runs all over the fretboard, guitar, guitar solos so tonally incredible that one's reflex is to perform the auditory equivalent of squinting your eyes to try and hear if that is indeed a guitar, as it could pass for a woodwind instrument or even just another synth line. But Guthrie Govan's finger tone is unmistakable as he performs what is not just his first incredible con contribution to the album, but his first incredible contribution to this single track. After all of this introduction plays out and the build maintained and suddenly exploded over the total of four and a half minutes of the album thus far finally winds down, we first get our, we, the, we get our first lyrics. Throughout the remainder of the song, Wilson paints a, a picture of our protagonist, one going through the turmoil of their young adulthood, depicting lost love. There was a time when someone seemed to care, a tourist in your bed, you left him there. The paralyzing nature of attempting to find one's place in the life they've built for themselves, with a hundred futures cascading down. Abusing drugs to cope with all of this, you slowly move towards the medicine chest. All of this eventually culminating in a glance at what I perceive to be the protagonist's internal monologue, in which she berates herself for wasting her own time on indecision, and as a result, living a life completely unfulfilled. Shame on you for getting older every day. This place is not for you, so why do you still stay? You're standing with the other fuckers in the rain. Life is not for some sinecure for you to claim. You have to pay. All of this emotional turmoil leads to what is essentially the inciting incident of the album, Pick it in the lines you only have to say and the world will slip away from you. In my interpretation, it's at this moment that our protagonist decides to detach herself from her current life altogether as the pressures of modern living in a metropolis finally prove too much to take. It's pretty difficult to not feel entirely overwhelmed by the pace that modern life moves at in this day and age. As for myself, I find it entirely understandable and even relatable that anyone would slip away from life altogether, given the means to do so. But truthfully, this is just the tip of uh, Han Kanai Race's emotional iceberg, so to speak. The idea that cracks open so many reflections on the life the protagonist has lived. Afterwards, we get the title track, which is the standout pick for a single on the album. It is, it's essentially a progressive pop song, much in the vein of Peter Gabriel's solo work, and it's just as pitch perfect as something like Salisbury Hill or In Your Eyes. Much like those singles, Han Kanata Race's heart is planted firmly on its sleeve. Its central guitar melody and chorus hook are almost sickeningly sweet, but Wilson and company deliver it with such conviction and emotional forthrightness that it's difficult not to be swept up in it. The fact it, much like every other the fact is, much like every uh, song on the album, it is... Fucking hell, I messed that whole sentence up. The fact it, that it, much like every song on the album, is one of the most incredibly produced, mixed, and arranged songs I've ever heard in my life certainly goes a long way in helping to get past any potential for corniness. 
It's an enrapturing, immaculate song, and the lyrics are stunning, depicting, depicting a story of a romantic partner of the protagonists. I view this track as a sort of flashback in the narrative of the album, the, the proverbial time when someone seemed to care from three years older. And perhaps the partner in question is the tourist in the protagonist's bed. Regardless, it's difficult to keep the tragedy of the previous song and by extension the remainder of the album from one's mind. Because we know that the proverbial hand, whatever you perceive that hand to be, as that's something that Wilson has been uh, deliberately cagey about uh, whenever he is asked, uh, did erase the love that they shared as the pressures of life came crashing down around them, forcing them apart and forcing our protagonist into isolation. Track four, track four, Perfect Life, is primarily a spoken word piece backed by a remarkably beautiful and atmospheric instrumental and programmed beat. The spoken word portion takes us even further back in the protagonist's life, back to her teenage years where her family fostered a girl three years her older. They became fast friends, shared music, books, clothes. The narrator says they were inseparable up until her foster sister moved on six months later and faded into hazy memories to such a degree that the narrator can no longer remember her name or what she looked like. This detail fleshes out the mental state of the protagonist for most of her life as this kind of forgetfulness is a symptom of Ill mental illnesses like depression. But if one takes a less literal interpretation, you can view it as a reflection of the nature of getting older Forgetting aspects of your youth, letting the things that shape you as a person fade into the deep recesses of your memory. It's this note that Perfect Life leaves us on as it blossoms into one of the most beautiful sections of Wilson's career as he repeats various variations of the phrase, we've got the perfect life, enveloped in a rich, swirling instrumental. This passage to me evokes the emotions of bitter nostalgia, a desperate longing for things to be the way they used to be. This track makes me incredibly, almost overwhelmingly emotional, kind of feeling that one can only, that can only come after years and years of developing a relationship with a, with a song or an album. And it's something that once again, I am left at a loss for words to describe. I also want to note here that the specific locations mentioned in the lyrics of Perfect Life, namely Blackbird's Moor to watch barges on Grand Union in the twilight, are taken directly from Wilson's childhood. He's elaborated in interviews that Blackbird, Blackbird's Moor is a park in his hometown of Hemel Hempstead, England, and Grand Union is a canal that runs through it. There are many moments here that Wilson takes from his own life and injects them into that of the protagonist, which lends the album an incredible amount of authenticity. This is where we arrive at Routine, perhaps the most harrowing song of Wilson's entire career. A nine-minute suite sung by both Wilson and guest vocalist and frequent collaborator Nanette Taeb, perhaps the only real break in the album's narrative, as its literal, literal interpretation and subsequent music video detail the life of a woman who has lost her husband and children and in order to cope, has maintained a strict routine when, that she follows to the letter every day of her life in order to maintain a sense of normalcy and pass the time in ways other than sitting in her home wracked with a grief beyond description. But I personally view the song as an extension of the life of the narrator, one that she's leading after completely isolating herself, maintaining a routine in order to maintain some sort of sanity now that she has cut off the vast majority of communication with the outside world. Despite her initial urge to detach from any common reality and effectively disappear from the world, she still feels some need for normalcy and routine in the life she lives now. But even if it's not meant to be a direct analog, the story still has much relevance to concepts of isolation and alienation that can come from living in a large city and the anonymity one can find if they so desire. As a whole, this track is one of the most remarkable achievements of the last decade of music across any genre. How it manages to remain deeply, deeply affecting without becoming overbearing or hackneyed, and the fact that it packs so much variety into nine minutes and still feels breathless is beyond my reckoning. And even after all that, and a ranking of all eight major movements on the record, a routine would probably come in last for me. 
Home Invasion is a bit of an outlier on the album, flying over the, all, all over the map in regard to genre, to sound and genre fusion at times in racing metal and at others taking the shape of almost swing jazz. And frankly, none of it should work, and it only fully unlocked itself to me once I took it in the context of a narrative. The placement of this and the following instrumental on the track list leads me to believe that it's essentially a depiction of a manic episode brought on by the chaos of living one's life solely through the internet. At this point, I think the protagonist has become completely untethered from reality, as they may be become somewhat addicted to the anonymity that living among so many people can provide, and seeks to live out as many lives and personas as possible through the anonymity of the internet and social media. This combined with a devastating toll constantly absorbing news takes on someone after a certain amount of time, the loss of faith in other people that sort of consumption breeds, leads to a complete break from reality and a depressive spiral, spiral for our protagonist as the song bounces from one chaotic section to the next, with Wilson slash the narrator singing about how alienating life has become. In the instrumental that follows Home Invasion, Regret Number 9 sonically depicts the come down from the episode depicted in its predecessor. The instrumental, and by extension, the narrator is still buzzing from the moments before, but it's subdued, more contained, and perhaps most darkly more resolved. It, as Regret Number 9 fades out and the lonely, disparate acoustic track Transience fades in, we flash back to an earlier time in the narrator's life for the final time. She reflects on her life, moments of hope and excitement of the life that lay before her, a time when she had all the time in the world. Both the lyrics and the instrumental evoke both the kind of nostalgia the narrator feels at the present moment and the dread that she feels when she thinks of whatever the future, future holds for her. And it provides one final moment of respite before the climax of the album and our protagonist's story. Put it simply, Ancestral is the single best thing Stephen Wilson has ever done. It isn't my favorite song of his, it isn't, it isn't even my favorite song on the album, but having heard the vast majority of the man's work, I feel confident in saying that this is the finest moment of songwriting instrumentation, instrumentation, arrangement, composition, production, and performance of his entire career. It's a 13-minute epic comprised of multiple movements, each one breathless and essential to the narrative, juggling various genres all while building a central tone and progression. This is, close, this is the closest we have gotten to the narrator's direct internal mon inner monologue through in the entirety of the album without it being a flashback, and it is an extraordinarily harrowing place to be. It's at this point that we find her at her lowest, her faith in herself and humanity in general all but obliterated, leaving nothing but contempt for both. Even more than any lyric in the song, the slow build and eventual emotional eruptions through it depict the mindset of someone at their single lowest point better than nearly any piece of music I've ever heard has. More than any other piece of music, it reminds me of the end of Mulholland Drive, the violent, harrowing end result of a person's years of emotional torment self-inflicted and otherwise. After this explosive climax, we arrive at final track, Happy Returns, and its instrumental outro ascendant here on. It's at this point that I feel compelled to talk about myself to some degree. For the majority of my life, I have felt disconnected from most of the people around me, whether that's through something as as simple as having nothing in common or just finding out that my brain kind of works differently than those of most other people I've met. I went long, long stretches of my life not having any real friends to speak of, no one to confide in. Whether or not my parents would have understood if I confided in them is another matter altogether, but the fact is that I would do everything I could to keep those thoughts from them. This manifested in actions ranging from either faking or making myself sick so I didn't have to go to school or trying to stomach it and just having panic attacks because I didn't know how to cope with feeling so alienated all the time. Naturally, as I grew up, I gained true friends and loved ones by my tribe, so to speak. At this stage in my life, I talk to my parents more than ever. I have more close friends than I ever have. And despite current circumstances driving a physical wedge between all of us, I am on better terms with any of them than I ever have been. 
but it's hard to ignore the frequent desire to drop off the face of the earth altogether, to disappear from the life of everyone I love, whether that's a purely selfish desire to completely isolate or a misguided belief that I would be doing them a favor by taking myself out of their respective equations. Both Final Track Happy Returns and Hand Canada Race as a whole understand and portray this feeling better than any other piece of art that I have ever encountered. To be sure, it's a very specific and modern feeling to have. I would be surprised if anything tries to get at what Hand Canada Race gets at and even comes close. Happy Returns is one of my three favorite songs of all time. It is one of the few works of art that I feel truly understands me kind of hate using this terminology just because it's been memed into oblivion at this point, but I feel seen by it. And for as often as I get on the show and talk about how things touch me deep down, nothing I've talked about has cut to the quick in the same way that Happy, Tur Happy Returns does every single time I hear it. It speaks truthfully of a, of a desire to be loved, held, and understood by people who you love and to do so in return but it acknowledges how extraordinarily difficult all of that can be for someone like me. My instinct at the first sign of any of the troubles life throws at me is to shut down, to shut myself away from any and everything so as not to hurt myself or hurt anyone else emotionally. But at the end of the day, that through all the life that I have lived thus far, I realized all that gets you is writing a letter to your brother, a letter asking if his kids remember you, when expressing the li a feeling of life passing you by like trains through a station, one letter you ultimately won't finish. Despite the inherent tragedy of the song, there is incredible catharsis to be found within it for someone who struggles to voice their feelings without some sort of mask or a measure of distance. Hearing this level of genuine expression is so freeing, it, fe it makes me feel like I am feeling every emotion as the at the same time, as silly as that may sound. By the time it fades out and Ascendant here on begins to play, I feel a release that is impossible to quantify. Whether it's the release from pain that the narrator ultimately feels at her own death, or the release of finally being heard is up to how one relates their own experiences to the material. But it is singular, something I have not found in any other piece of art. There aren't many artistic experiences I've had in my life that I would genuinely call life altering, but Hand Cannot Erase is one of them. Through all the years that I have spent with it, all the time that I have taken to unpack it at this level, I've found that it fundamentally changed the way I look at life. Because for as much as an introvert as I am, I do need people around me. That's something I needed to hear when I was 17 when I heard it for the first time, and it's something I still need to hear every now and then today. No one can ever tr do, truly do anything of importance alone, and as often as my faith in us as a species is tested, our reason for being here is as simple as possible. I believe it's simply to share life with as many people you love as possible. Something I wish I could have told the protagonist of this album, something I wish I could have told myself much younger ages, uh, something I wish I could have told Joyce Carol Vincent. Because I truly, I feel that I truly do understand them both, at least to some degree. And I know that when someone who truly understands me is generous enough to open themselves up, to let me realize that we are only ever truly alone if we choose to be, I feel like not a single aspect of life's often overwhelming trials and tribulations is enough to stand in my way. All right, I made it through that. That was cool. Good job. Congratulations and great job, man. You know, they say the, the good review is like an artistic expression in itself. And it, in the way, it like the end of a great piece of art that I, I got to the end of that review and was like, wow, I needed to hear that. Thank you. you know? so, Sorry. Thank you. Yes, uh, interestingly enough, it's, 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 I find it funny that people will thank me for that kind of thing because it's like, it, it, the desire to do that in the first place comes from a purely selfish area um, it, it, I, I wrote all of that and said it because I needed to hear it before anybody else did mm -hmm. um, but that's just a, a, the most joyous side effect of sharing any endeavor with other people 
any artistic endeavor. Sure. Just that it being able to share in that feeling and give that uh, just even being able to give that feeling to someone else is extraordinarily humbling. I'm, I'm I think the beauty to... inherent with the connection we have is that the things that we most desperately need to tell ourselves are also the things that other people need to hear and we don't always know that until we say them. And on that note, it's very, uh, yeah, it's very true. Yeah. yeah. On that note, on that note, uh, let's talk <laughs> about our favorite tracks and readings for <gasps> I'd love to. Hand cannot erase. Um, um, Jake, we'll just do our regular order then. Jake, why don't you yeah, go first? Not? Yeah. Um, and if anything, this was actually like harder than Dead Wing, just because, I mean, come on. But mm. uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go with my three favorites being Happy Returns, Ancestral, and Routine. I, I do not have a least favorite track. Ten. Shocker. <laughs> Couldn't have called that. Okay, well, my favorite uh, tracks are uh, Three Years Older, Happy Returns, and I'll throw in Ancestral, uh, least favorite transients, I guess. Uh, for me, this would get an 8 out of 10. Very good, very good. Um me is Morgan's go next. Yes. <laughs> the way you said that sounded like you were you were talking to a dog who had just done a neat trick. <laughs> yeah. My wow. my dog shat on the rug three times today and I cleaned it up each time. <laughs> yeah. This <laughs> is all I am. A dog to you. No, my dog's just very old and incontinent. <laughs> Yeah. I love how you just couldn't see how that was like what you were implying by bringing that up so <laughs> obviously anyway Better that I, I'm dispelled. <laughs> oh yeah I'll, I'll, I'll walk off a bridge now sorry I'm autistic it happens <laughs> no it's fine <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, any, any, anywho. Um, yeah. <laughs> my, my three favorite tracks are um, Happy Returns, Perfect Life, and Ancestral. Uh, followed by Transients, then Three Years Older, then Hand Cannot Erase, then home invasion and regret number nine and then routine i do not have a least favorite track uh, i mean you didn't gather that by now yeah so it's like a six or something yeah it's mm. like yeah i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna get this to a hundred by giving this album a 12 out of 10 that way we can just up <laughs> our average that's not how math works, but I'm going to do it anyway. No, it's not how math works, Morgan. I'm sorry. Um, but for me, my favorite tracks were Routine, Transience, and Home Invasion slash Regret, Regret number nine. Um, and I'm giving this album a 10 out of 10. Very fair. I wish... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm still, still thinking of you with your dog shitting on the carpet. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, so my three favorite tracks are Routine, Hand Cannot Erase, and Ancestral. Like, my least favorite track is Chinese Satellite. It gets a 10 out of 10. Nice. Oh. <laughs> so that's a 9.9.6 .9 on average, which is the same as uh, Bone Machine and Blackwater Park. And uh, wow, yeah, 
I, I was gonna Damn. I was gonna you know yeah pretty good yeah. pretty good for this uh, Wilson fellow <laughs> really, all right. really glad you got to a complete thought there eventually yeah, yeah, so thank. that 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 concludes oh, our tribute to um, Stephen Wilson uh, so and two of his two of his greatest records. Um, uh, let us know, please, what you think of these records and what your favorite Porcupine Tree and or Stephen Wilson records are. Uh, next week we will be returning to business as usual. We're going to be reviewing the new Shame album, Drunk Tank Pink. Uh, and a second album, which is as yet undecided. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, look out for that. Um, but yeah, I'd uh, love to he- love to hear from you all what you thought of our episode. And uh, so follow us on Twitter, which is in the description if you're not already following us. And yeah, anyone else got anything they want to plug? Like we have shit going on in our lives. Search's new record <laughs> is coming out soon. Yes, um, it is. Yeah. Um, although. Um, I was planning on plugging that next week because it comes out the Friday after that. Uh, But I'll plug it anyway now. My record's coming out in two weeks. Yes. I'm very excited about that. It's it's good to build hype. Yeah, exactly. Um, So, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, Rock over London. Rock Rock on on Chicago. Chicago. Coca-Cola. Open happiness.